start the meeting, okay? You ready? Okay. Good evening. It's October 17th, 2022. On July 16th, 2022, an act was signed into law which extends the suspension of certain provisions of the open meeting law, allowing us to meet remotely without a quorum in the room. However, I do wanna note that we actually do allow um, audience to be physically in the room. Given the, that we have a quorum of the council present, I'm calling the October 17, 2022 Special Town Council meeting labeled as a Town Council Working Session on Residential Rental Bylaws to order at, six, at 531. This is the first of three meetings tonight, tonight, all of which will be accessible on the same Zoom link through Amherst Media and in person. Uh, there will be no public comment during this particular portion of the meeting. There will be opportunities for public comment in the next two meetings. However, please do not hesitate to send us written public comment at www.amherstma.gov slash council comments or through our email. There will be no public, I'm sorry, um, there will be a public forum on financial orders after this special meeting at 6.30 and a regular town council meeting at 6.45 which will, both of which will include public comment. I'm going to call upon counselors, please unmute and say present and uh, tell, let us know that you can hear us and we can hear you. Uh, Shalini Balmil. I see Shalini, but she's not answering. Pat DeAngelis. Present. Anna Devlin Gothier. Trapped in the waiting room. Thank you. Sorry, I was just watching this. Lynn Griesmer is present. Mandy Jo Haneke. Present. Anika Lopes. Present. Michelle Miller. Present. Dorothy Pam. Here. Pam Rooney. Present. Kathy Shane is absent this evening. Andy Lynn. Steinberg. Sorry. Present. Jennifer Taub. Present. Alicia Walker is not here yet. I'm going to go back. Shalini Balmil. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. All right. So we have 11 counselors at this time. Um, there's no chat room. If you have technical issues, please make sure Athena and I know, and we'll figure out what to do if we have to stop the meeting while you reconnect. With that, I'm going to turn this over to the very hardworking CRC committee. Um, and Mandy Jo Haneke is chair, and we're going to put up some slides. Thank you. Thank you. The slides can wait just a little bit. Um, but yeah, thank you all for coming. Uh, this is the second, I guess, working session, but the first one since this matter was referred to CRC, and we're going to be talking about rental permitting today. Um, CRC has been working since March to come up with some draft language for a what will end up being a repeal and replace bylaw um, because it's so big. Um, but also, in the course of all of that, we've been working on and just started working on a fee structure. We talked a little bit about that last week and regulations are now going to be involved with this too. <clears throat> Our work has encompassed nearly every meeting we've had and we have had Rob Mora or John Thompson or mainly both of them at pretty much every meeting to help advise us. Um, regarding all of this, we've also held one listening session for the from the public um, in the middle of the summer and the next one coming up next week to hear from the public and <clears throat> excuse me we um have been receiving many comments from the public also during meetings as well as email um to us and through various communications we've had we have talked to the board of licensing commissioners and ecac and have had representatives from them show up either at our meetings or i've been to their meetings to discuss it parts of this bylaw that involve them um, the packet includes the current draft bylaw and includes a table that shows the current bylaw and a comparison between that and what our working draft bylaw is. Um, at this time, uh, Athena, can you put up the first slide? 
what we're planning on doing today is I have three slides that encompass parts of each sec of the sections of the bylaw. We will, I just, we basically want to hear from you on what you think about the draft specific language okay, but mainly areas of concern, areas of likes, areas of things that maybe we've changed that you don't like or we haven't changed that you like or don't like, things like that. Um, questions you have, I will be taking a lot of comments, uh, a lot of notes about comments and any questions you have. I've already received questions from one counselor today um, and I will attempt to gather all of them into one document to put in the next council packet with answers to the best of my ability that I can answer. So the first set I'd like to spend about 10 minutes or so on, because I think these are sort of the least concerning in terms of changes and stuff that people may see. But if we need a little more time, we will. The slide after this deals with inspections and other requirements to obtain a permit. And the slide after that is complaints, violations, and regulations. And this is basically a copy of the chart. You see one thing in red, and that's because at our last meeting at CRC last week, um, during discussions as we go back through these documents, uh, the committee, along with Rob and um, John Thompson, believed that we should delete the requirement to obtain a permit before offering to rent um, instead of the advertising okay without a permit as long as the application is pending. I didn't quite fix all of the working draft sections there. Um, and so I noted that in red. There's another red section later on about some other things. So that is one change from the memo that you got because of discussions that we had last week at CRC. So at this point, I'm just going to open it up to the floor um, to see if there are any comments or questions with regard to what we've done with permitting requirements um, or the, the requirement to obtain a permit, not the requirements for what that means. Um, um, exemptions, so who does not have to obtain a permit? Who does not have to apply? Um, issuance and denial, that's how do you, what do you have to do to be issued a permit, um, which is different from that you have to have a permit. And then consent and other requirements. And um, these are just sort of things that don't really fit into any one big section, but it's things like in the current draft that um, a landlord consents to, at this point, inspections um, of the property by the inspection services division on application applying for a permit. Um, I do want to say one other thing. I put it in the packet. We have out for legal review a lot of questions. Those do not have answers yet. Um, the town attorney will be coming to CRC's meeting on the 27th to um, have a conversation with CRC about a lot of those questions because they really do fall into a bunch of groups. Um, and so I can take more legal questions if you have them, but you've seen everything we sent to the town attorney for that. And that means some of what we might be discussing today could see a lot of changes if we get information that we can't do what we're trying to do. Um, and Lynn, do you want me to be able to call on people or would you like to do that? Please go right ahead. Okay. So the floor is open for these four sections. Um, when we get to the last, we'll have time for just general comments too and questions. Dorothy. Well, you said in red, deleting permit required before offering to rent. So I'm reading the top boxes and all of them are talking about offering to rent. So it's really hard to understand what you mean there. Um, so I cross, I'm crossing it out, but um, I, I mean, the whole box has to go, I believe. I'm almost everything in it, if you're gonna cut, take that out, which is fine with me. I understand why you made the decision, but... Um, so, so I'll answer that, Dorothy. Thank you for the question. Um, quickly, right now our bylaw requires that you have to obtain a permit before you rent a place or offer to rent a place, which means before someone occupies it under a rental or before you basically say and put out there in the world or hire a management company and say, hey, I wanna rent my, my apartment or I wanna rent this house that I own. Before you'd even be able to do that in the current bylaw, you have to obtain a permit. Um, the working draft now says you have to have that permit before that lease goes active, before the start date of the lease um, is what the working draft says. So we had, when I wrote this, had that it was the same, basically the same as what the current bylaw requires, um, which meant we also would put into that that you could actually put that advertisement out there before the lease started, and as long as you'd applied for the permit, even if you didn't have it in hand. Right. So I, I understand why some people wouldn't like it, but I have to say, 
you know, I haven't been working on this like you have, but it seems to me a good time to a, get a permit is after you have gotten it ready, it has been inspected and okayed. I mean, advertising rent in a property that has not been inspected and okayed for rent, I think may lead to further problems, but I'm sure you guys discussed that. So just interested in knowing your reasoning on this. Um, it became a question of, and, and the other CRC members can jump in if they've got anything else to say, because this was just a recent discussion. I believe it became a question of how is that manageable? Um, in terms of when are things offered to rent, when are leases signed versus when things are active, um, and some of the other things we've gotten. And so the the whole point is to make sure it's not occupied when it's not habitable, when to make sure the occupation is there. That doesn't necessarily mean you need that permit in hand in order to potentially six months before you actually start that lease say, I want to rent this. And, and one of the things we know is some of the leases get signed in, in October or November for June or July start dates, or even September start dates of the next year. And so it, it was more of a, in my mind, a logistical matter that didn't change much of the operation of the bylaw. That's an okay. <laughs> Lynn, Lynn, if yes. we could please, Alicia's joined, if we could please confirm that she can hear uh, us. I mean, did you, I need to pause for just a moment and make sure that Alicia can hear us. Um, yes, I can. Thank you, Lynn. Thanks, Alicia. Okay. Thank um, you. Michelle. Yes, thank you for all of this work. This is amazing. Um, I have two questions right now. So one is, um, I see that the Airbnb types are exempted. Um, do we currently, and maybe I should know this, keep any sort of database or registration of um, homes or properties that are potentially being rented as Airbnbs? Do you know? So I don't know whether we do right now or not, but I wanted to correct that not all Airbnbs are going to be exempted from this bylaw. Um, only those, you know, and, and I'd have to go look at the specifics. I believe it's less than 14 days a year. So if you are, if you do your Airbnb um, for two days over graduation weekend, and that's the only time you ever do an Airbnb, you don't need a permit under the current draft. But if you've made it sort of your business and you're doing that Airbnb for three months, four months, one month of the whole year or all year, you will need a permit under this bylaw. Got it. Thank you. And then the second question is, I recently received a letter um, stating that you know, something to the effect of it appears you may have an accessory dwelling unit and you may need to register kind of thing, uh, which was pretty neat to receive that. I do, in fact, I'm sitting in that accessory dwelling and I don't rent it. Um, so at, at least I, I, I'm not renting it currently. So there wasn't necessarily a way to, obviously I can just send an email, go find an email and send it and say, hey, I'm not renting it right now. But I wondered if there might be a way to have some sort of easy form or something like that, that would allow me to let um, the building department know that I'm not and the ins inspections people know that I'm not currently renting the accessory dwelling. That's more of a comment. No, thank you for that. I'll make a note there. Uh, Lynn. Um, I'm sure gonna, this is going to be a topic we'll discuss later, but I'm particularly looking at consent and other requirements. And I, this is an area in which I have the feeling we can't tighten it a whole lot more than we have suggested here, but it's an area I know in my district and Pat's in my district, district two has always been brought up that people will see seven cars parked out a parked outside of a house that is essentially meant for four people and yet they have to make an appointment to access the house 
and talk to the tenants. And I'm assuming nothing you've put here in J or any of the other bullets changes that. It's still with notice. So yes, right now, um, the draft is that tenants would have to be notified before an inspection if it is occupied and would have to give their consent um, on a time by time basis. Um, right now, the draft says that the property owner consents to inspections under this bylaw upon application for a permit. Those are questions that have been asked to the lawyer to see what the parameters of those two issues and requirements are. Okay. Thank you for pursuing that. Seeing no other hands with that one, um, can we move to the next slide, Athena? So this next slide is one of the bigger ones that represents a bigger change to our um, current practice, which is the current practice is self-certification of um, compliance with all laws and regulations relating to habitability, um, zoning, and all of that. And the draft is moving to inspection by town officials, no self-certification of compliance of those health safety, life safety, building inspection type requirements um, that our own town inspectors would inspect properties in order for them to be able to obtain a permit. Um, much of the inspections, some of that inspection and stuff would go under regulations, but we've put some parameters into how often a, a unit would need to be inspected into the bylaw itself. Although those could be tightened more under regulations, the current thinking is that the regular inspection for a typical property would be every three years um, and that that could lengthen up to five years. Um, depending on per, per regulations and, and the current sort of thinking, although it has not been discussed, is that if there aren't violations during those three years of, of which we're not sure what those violations would be because it hasn't been discussed, then you could get five years between inspections. Also, long term tenants that aren't that have occupied the place for more than five years would not need to undergo an inspection every three years. Um, that subsidized housing right now, that is fully exempted if they have um, regular inspections. We would be moving that to a may be exempted from the inspections um, instead of shall be exempted. And the, the other one is that the, even though it's a three-year regular, that time frame could be increased to more frequent um, if there are proper, if the property seems to be not passing inspection regularly. And so that's the biggest, those are sort of the biggest changes here. There are other permit requirements that are being added um, or that are already there right now that are being brought over to the new working draft. But the biggest change there is that there will be some energy efficiency standards added. And this is the other one that has a change from the um, time I wrote this memo. And that's in red. We actually have received ECAC's recommendations. Um, on what that would look like. It is not in the draft right now. It will be in the next draft that is created for the November 3rd CRC meeting, um, some of those recommendations. But basically they're recommending for one to four units that they have to do the, the, um, the Eversource energy home check, that free energy home check. And that for above five units that the property would have to have a EPA um, Portfolio manager, aggregated energy use, complete that program, which is a free program. And basically, they just want to track for that one how much energy is being used in a on a property. So those are the big changes from the last time. Comments and questions on this these two parts. Dorothy. I had a, a question before, uh, still lagging on inspection. What currently is the law for um, inspections? Um, I just was thinking of the uh, party at that fraternity, I guess it was Allen Street, 
where they did not let the inspector in. Um, what is the present law as to how many days, what kind of notice is it? Does it have to be written? Um, doesn't that tie the hands uh, of um, our officials, town officials, if there seems to be some problems going on? Or is that a separate category because some kind of nuisance complaint is going on as opposed to? So I can't answer that question accurately. I know Rob could, but I don't, is, is Rob is here. So Rob, take it away. <laughs> uh, good evening. Uh, yes, so the, uh, the first thing we do when we're conducting inspections or want to con conduct an inspection of a property is call for the lease language. Uh, the bylaw currently does provide, uh, gives, gives us the ability to ask for the lease, and that needs to be provided to us within 48 hours. Oftentimes, we get it right away, or at least the language that we need right away. Uh, and we try to follow uh, the lease language uh, to give the notice that is uh, offered to the tenant uh, through that language. Now, if there's an emergency situation, we'll definitely ask the landlord uh, or their owner to um, to try a little harder to get access and arrange access quicker. And as our last resort, we would go to the court and ask for a order to enter the property uh, at, a, at a time uh, certain uh, that's authorized by, by the court. Uh, generally, most cases we ask for an inspection the same afternoon the next day, and it's usually accommodated uh, by everyone involved. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Rob. Other thoughts on the direction we are taking regarding um, inspections or anything else? Anna, you just had your hand up. It doesn't have to be. Sorry, my microphone was far away. Um, I'm curious if you, and I'm trying to scroll through fast, but I'm gonna, ask it because that's faster than trying to find it in the document. Um, when folks, <clears throat> excuse me, are filling out their registration, are you looking at, or are you collecting any information about other energy efficiencies in the, um, in the rental? So things like what the heat source is, age of the furnace, if it's a boiler, if it's a heat pump, if they have AC, um, is that information that you're collecting? And then the reason I say that is it can help us in terms of understanding where our community is at for efficiencies, but also support. Um, we could have a database uh, that helps owners, uh, rental property owners with things like replacements or when incentives are available. We know those are coming up through the, um, in the next couple of years. So I'm just curious about if that's part of this process or might be. Thanks. So it will be part of the process. Um, we just received a list of, I just received, and I have not, again, the next draft on November 3rd will incorporate these questions into the drafts and the regulations. Um, most of those questions will show up in the regulations, not the bylaw itself, because yeah. they can be modified more easily for flexibility when things change or we have the information like us to ask our, um, and I won't go through the whole list, but our, has the building received an energy efficiency rating? Yeah. Um, are there electric vehicle charging stations and does it host solar on, yeah. on, on the thing? But then about the building itself, the age of building, gross square footage, condition space, bedrooms, bathrooms, building env envelope renovated, um, insulation types, fuel types, mm -hmm. heating system types, um, age, efficiency and who pays bills are sort of around what ECAC has been asking us to put in that. And so that will show up in the next draft um, under some of that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And good work. These are y'all. I know I've worked really hard on this. Lynn. Um, would you please share with us some of the discussion about occupancy limits that the committee has been having. So the committee has had some discussions surrounding occupancy limits, um, both in terms of changing them and in terms of what to do when occupancy limits in the zoning bylaw are seen to be violated under inspection. Um, 
in whether to change the occupancy limits, that is peripheral in some sense to this discussion and this bylaw because that's a zoning bylaw matter. Um, occupancy limits are listed, I believe, in two sections of the zoning bylaw. Um, under, I think, ADUs, there is an occupancy limit that is different than a, the typical four. Um, and the four is listed, I believe, in the definition section of the bylaw okay. under what a family means. And so that's a little peripheral, although we have had discussions about that as it somewhat relates to the work we've been doing. <clears throat> in terms of the work we've been doing, the discussions have revolved around sort of what does a violation of the rental permit constitute? Does an occupancy limit violation constitute a violation of the rental permit bylaw? Should it constitute a violation of the rental permit bylaw? And if it is a violation, what is an appropriate penalty? Um, and so right now it's listed as a violation that you have to comply with those occupancy limits um, as a term of the permit. Um, but the violation um, is, is not any specific violation, any, the penalty for that violation is not any specific penalty at this point. There are prior drafts that had a specific penalty of re revocation of the permit. That specific penalty for that a, a particular occupancy violation has been removed. And so it would go into sort of, it would be up to the, um the building inspector or enforcement personnel to determine what penalty to ascribe to that violation if it is found um there are also legal questions that we've got out there about what we can do about that um including what lease terms can be and all of that that we've we've had to wrestle with because depending on how things go depends on you know people are living there right um and and there's been discussion about do do you kick people out do you not what's the purpose and all of that um so i i guess that's that's the way i would summarize the discussions i would um before i recognize andy see if anyone uh, else um i believe jennifer and pam are here um, and Pat from the committee and Shalini, the rest of the committee are there if they would like to add anything to my summary of sort of where those occupancy limit discussions have been. Um, uh, Shalini and then Jennifer and then we'll move to Andy. Yeah, I apologize. I was not able to complete the analysis of the data that we received uh, like over 250, I think responses from landlords uh, neighbors and tenants. And there was a lot of mention of the four tenant rule and how it impacts the tenants, how it impacts the residents. Uh, not much was said by the landlords. So there will be a more detailed report coming from the perspective of what we're hearing from the tenants and how it's impacting them and the residents. So I'm hoping that that's going to inform this discussion a little bit more. Um, I don't think I need to say much more at this point, but um, but it does create a lot of anxiety and uh, stress for tenants. They talked about the cost factor, how it's um, increasing the cost of rents and um, and how it's also being the four tenant rule is being used sometimes by landlords to prevent the tenants from ask, complaining about what's wrong. So, I mean, there's a lot more detail I'll be offering. And then of course, from the resident side, they were concerned about the number of cars that are parked on the streets, the, the additional, um, the density, the traffic, all of that. And so I think we may need to have another discussion once all of this information is brought before us. Thank you, Shalini. Jennifer. Um, yes, thank you. So uh, <laughs> in, in the feedback that we received from um, the forums, uh, you know, both during the public, uh, the community forum and on the Engage Amherst um, forums that the, 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 the non-student households feel very strongly that the four, um, 
occupant limit is essential. Um, I am not aware of any college or university town that does not have limits on houses that are rented to students. Um, many have three, we have four. It is definitely the ex experience that whatever the limit is, there will be more people living in the house. Um, so you raise it to six and then you have eight. But that said, you know, there is the issue that you can't just evict people that legally, and that's not what we're looking to do, but um, there is discussion that landlords need to be responsible. And certainly if you're violating the bylaw that when you come to renew your permit the next year, that's something that um, may be taken uh, into consideration, but, um, and in terms of the rents, uh, it is landlords rent by the bedroom or by the person. So it's not like a house is, for, you know, being rented for $4,000 and that's what it will be if six or seven tenants live there. If, if it's, if the tenant, if the landlord is leasing the house and knows how many people are there, if the limits were to be raised to six, let's say, then each at 4,000, you know, if it's $1,000 a bedroom, it'll be $6,000. So um, we're not, you know, if there was any discussion of increasing the limit, that wouldn't lower the rent for the tenants, you know, for those that are legally living there and that are on the lease. So, but it's a, uh, it's it's um, a conversation that we've had, but there haven't been um, since the, as uh, Mandy Jo said, since it's the zoning bylaw right now that speaks to tenants and we're only working with the rental permitting bylaw. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Andy. So my question actually had to do with uh, I think a related topic to occupancy limits, and that's the parking plan requirement. And uh, because I think that what we've uh, generally observed is that uh, when you can tell if there are a large number of guests, either for a special event, a week weekend, or on a regular basis, just by the number of cars parked um, there, um, I was curious about uh, what has been done to, to look at the parking plan requirement from what we currently have and what has gone well and what has not, where it's complying with the uh, zoning bylaw, uh, what happens if, uh, the, it, if the, somebody submits a parking plan that includes parking on the front lawn and is that because that's I think not allowed by the zoning bylaw, and what happens if uh, uh, it regularly occurs anyway, and therefore people are parking in violation of the parking plan? So I was curious whether you've had any of those discussions because I think that relates back to what Lynn was talking about earlier. Yeah, a few discussions. Um, we've relied heavily on Rob and John's experience with the parking plan to. Um, and the current bylaw to to inform the the new draft. Basically, we've moved nearly all the requirements into the, I believe, into the regulations. Um, it's more of an enforcement issue than um, in terms of then requiring different things for the parking plan. Um, according to Rob and all. Um, and so it doesn't mean there's going to be a lot of changes in the bylaw itself versus another aspect of enforcing what's submitted in the application. Um, Pam just raised her hand, so she might have some more information on that. And then I'll go to Michelle. So Pam. Thank you. Um, we have not actually talked about this in detail yet. And one of the things, as, as everyone here has said, the parking is probably one of the highest pension markers uh, it, within neighborhoods where we have um, traffic generated by the, the occupants of a house. And we have the, the haphazard parking in front of the house. 
so so right now um we look at i mean the the inspectors look at parking as something that is sort of generally covered under zoning and i think this i what i hope to see happen is that we tighten up the expectations for a what the, the plan submitted is the plan reviewed and then the enforcement of that plan when when people meet the expected layout and the and the expected parking procedures there will be less conflict with their neighbors so it will become i think a fairly important enforcement uh and and potentially violation um issue just as over occupancy will become something that can be much more clearly and much more carefully managed because those are the two those are the absolute two most um uh largest causes of conflict within our neighborhood thanks thank you pam michelle thank you um first i want to wholeheartedly agree with what jennifer said about um if we were to increase occupancy limits i, I don't think that a landlord is saying i'm gonna um, rent this house for X amount and then, you know, divide it out by four or five or six. I think they're going to say I've got five or six and I'm going to charge them each this amount. And that was the case for me here in Amherst as a college student. Um, so unless we were to have some sort of ordinance, and I don't know what the legalities of this are, that would essentially create rent control or limit the, you know, create a maximum amount of rent that a place can be charged, I think, um, or that a, a landlord can charge, I think, I don't think it would work in that way. Um, and that is a legal question I would have. Um, and then the other pieces way back when, when we first started this work, and I was able to join meetings more frequently, I remember I brought the topic up of increasing the occupancy limit from four to five. And I realized even early on that that was a, <laughs> a tense conversation to have. Um, but I do recall that Rob had talked about um, additional safety requirements that um, were activated when you moved from four to five that maybe were pursuant to the building code or law, um, which could, support overall safety, more overall safety, and then also incentivize better maintenance overall. So I was just wondering if Rob recalled that conversation um, and if that in fact is true that if we had moved from four to five, if it does activate some additional requirements that the landlord um, would need to partake in. Rob? Uh, yes, that's true. Uh, it's actually above five. So at, at number six for occupancy, it uh, activates uh, a series of fire regulations that would include, um, you know, very basic sprinkler systems, uh, fire alarm, uh, and, and um, some other life safety uh, features in the building. Uh, you know, for us, uh, we, you know, we really see an advantage, of course, having a sprinkler system, but maybe mo most importantly to have a fire alarm that's connected to a monitoring service uh, so that it's not so easy to tamper with smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors in, in the dwelling units. But uh, that is correct. It's uh, above five occupants, though. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Dorothy. Um, that regulation could be changed and that could be done for uh, four occupants. I understand that sprinklers are a useful thing, but this past weekend we had the absolute chaos, a free for all on Lincoln and Sunset with parking on both sides of the street, uh, driveways blocked, fire, uh, ambulances unable to come to the aid of a person having a serious reaction to a bee sting, which, bee sting, which you know is life threatening. Um, the other part is people saying, oh, we'll make more parking spots. So how we have a house with a small yard, very small, but it is space that tenants could actually use for themselves. And we know they do. They have their beer pong parties where they sit out and enjoy the sun. But those spaces will be taken up by more and more cars if you add more occupants because the yards don't get bigger. And these are the places where all the students are. They're not that big. So 
yes, sprinklers would be nice. A fire, directly wired uh, fire alarm would be nice. You can require that. Increasing the occupancy would absolutely destroy the neighborhoods. And we have said this again and again. And if anyone went to Lincoln or Sunset this past weekend, you would understand what it what we're talking about. It was complete chaos. So I, I see that this people want to increase occupancy, but I'm telling you, it would be a very, very bad idea. Thank you, Dorothy. We're going to hear from Shalini and Jennifer, and then we're going to move on to the third slide. Um, okay, so I don't know how deep you're going, but since everyone's talking about it, I just feel compelled to then share more that um, I do, at least having gone really deep into all of the data and all the comments from the resident side and the tenant side, I think the general sense is not from the tenant side also to increase the number of tenants universally across the town. But the feeling was that if this, if the zoning, if the space, if the parking, or if the, the house has six rooms, and six bedrooms, and there's space for parking, um, and there's enough size, we are wasting those two bedrooms when there's such a shortage of housing in this town. There are two bedrooms in multiple houses that could be housing more, res uh, more tenants that should not go wasted. So the idea was not that across the board, it should increase. In fact, in certain areas, the tenants themselves were like, maybe they shouldn't even allow four in that house because it's right next to X, Y, Z. So it's really, I think it, it requires a deeper, more reflective um, discussion about um, uh, and, and as Mandijo pointed out, maybe it's a zoning issue and that needs to go. But since we're looking at the um, the application or the monitoring of it, I think it's an important discussion for us to have also. But it really uh, does bring out the discrimination against tenants when, you know, there could be a family living with six people or eight people and that's allowed. But if it's six tenants that's not allowed given that that house can allow for the parking and so so all I'm saying is that I think we need to have a more detailed discussion on that and parking definitely was the high the second highest thing that residents were dissatisfied about you know especially parking haphazardly over the lawns the disarray and so I think that again how our bylaw is going to support um, and making sure that, um, and, and there were other things like zip cars, can those be allowed? And so there were like other suggestions that tenants made to also offset some of those parking problems. So I look forward to sharing the report with you all within a week. We look forward to it too. Thank you, Shalini. Jennifer. Uh, yes, I need to, and I just, this isn't why I initially raised my hand, but I have to respond. Um, in terms of the extra bedrooms in a house, it's not, it's not like a family. A family with four kids, five kids doesn't have a car, you know, just in terms of cars, doesn't have, usually have a car per family member. Um, when they're rented to students, <laughs> you know, that's, it just exacerbates every issue that's already there. I mean, you have if you were to say, well, this is a house with seven bedrooms, we could have, you know, some of the older houses have six and seven bedrooms. You know, they, each person has four friends over and then you basically have a party and you have their cars coming and going, you know, well past the time that their non, you know, student neighbors have gone to sleep. It's a very different situation having more than four unrelated people versus a family unit with the same um, number of people. I mean, it just, uh, we, have to, we, we have to balance the need for housing for the UMass students with a livable neighborhoods for, you know, non-student households. We just, we have, we have to do that. The, but the, I did want to ask Rob, I guess, as Dorothy said, I know, I believe it's a state requirement that if there's more than five, tenants, then there are, you know, um, sprinkler systems in a certain kind of, you know, 
a fire alarm required, but couldn't Amherst have that be a regulation if we wanted to for four tenants? That's Rob. a question. Uh, no, we cannot. So that, that is a, a mass general law. It's uh, enforced by the fire department uh, and it, it complements the building code that we enforce as well in our sanitary code. And the town cannot write a local bylaw that uh, that alters or change or, or lessens or strengthens uh, any of those codes and regulations. Uh, it has been tried. The fire services in Springfield tried it uh, six or eight years ago, and that that uh, ultimately failed. Uh, and and uh, the courts ruled that to be uh, not a legal uh, uh, regulation that could carry forward. I also, if, if it um, because it's appropriate. Um, we have so many examples over the years, but I, I just wanted to mention one one reason why we we even consider this or continue to talk about you know the the occupants in certain buildings. Uh, we're we're dealing with a case right now where uh, there are seven occupants that we uh, became aware of through our inspections, and uh, the house is large enough; it's in perfectly fine condition. Each occupant has its own their own private uh, living space, uh, but we cited them in violation of the four unrelated, uh, just as we have many times over the years. And usually we can negotiate, you know, some resolution. Uh, in this case, uh, the, the tenants uh, hired a lawyer and in response, the landlord hired a lawyer and ultimately a uh, restraining order was filed and we were, were called to a uh, hearing uh, with the court. And, you know, one of the questions that came to us uh, through the magistrate from the judge is, is the building safe? Are, are, th are there any health and safety issues within the building? And we didn't have any, it was solely a zoning matter. So, you know, this is a really complicated, you know, not an easy answer to, to uh, the subject and how we're going to solve this, but uh, you know, we we did not get a feeling of support from the court in that case, and ultimately uh, got out of that uh, that setting and negotiated a uh, uh, an agreement with the tenants to leave by a certain date. Um, you know, which was generous, uh, depending on who you're talking to. I guess was generous. Uh, we thought it was generous, but they didn't think it was enough. Uh, about three months. So, um, and this is still being finalized, so I don't wanna go into too many specifics about the property, but uh, that's the kind of thing we deal with over and over again. Uh, so it's, it's a, lot, uh, a lot stronger of a case for us if there's a health safety violation. And obviously that's our first uh, goal and major effort is to make sure it's safe living conditions. If they're not safe living conditions, you know, such as, uh, living in the basement, uh, in an unfinished basement with, uh, you know, curtains hanging between spaces to separate them. Those are dealt with immediately. But when you've got a really large building with uh, multiple rooms that serve as bedrooms, although the property card in our record doesn't show them as bedrooms, it becomes really difficult to enforce a zoning bylaw, uh, certainly in any reasonable time frame. I just want to call attention to the fact that we only have 12 minutes left on this section. Yep, Thank you. which is why we're moving on to the third. Um, Thank you. Slide. Um, and so the third slide, Athena, could you move to the third slide? Yes, so this is complaints and violations, which is another section we're really trying to beef up in terms of um, clarity and what can be done and how you decide what is done. Um, and then I just put regulations on here because I, I think CRC, we have not discussed the regulations that are in the packet. They are right now a amalgam of and a conglomeration of just things we've discussed in prior things that said, oh, that would be good for a regulation. What would we include in a regulation? But we have not discussed after we pushed it over to regulation what we would actually do with that, looking specifically at the regulations. Um, but any feedback, comments, questions on the complaint structure that we've gone with, the possibility, the biggest new thing in this would be creation of a designation of a problem property. 
Um, most of that designation creation is done under the regulations or is intended to be done under the regulations. We'll find out soon whether we can do it under the regulations or whether we have to do it within the bylaw. Um, and then using that designation as a method of determining when to suspend a permit, when to not renew a permit, when to um, you know sort of deny a permit instead of renewing a permit, when to potentially revoke a permit, um, and things like that. And so comments on the complaints and violations, you'll see we've upped the fine from 100 a day to 300 a day per violation, um, which is the maximum we can do. Um, and so any comments, thoughts, questions on the complaints, violations, the regulations, or any general comments anyone has um, on the work we've been doing, questions you'd like to see answered, other things we might not have considered that you'd like us to consider. No one seems to have any comments. Any final thoughts, comments on regulations? I will say before, since there are no hands up, CRC took its first stab at a um, fee structure, fee schedule last week. Um, that was a very good discussion. We've tentatively settled on something that we will be able to work with to then get the information we need to run numbers on what fees might look like and how we could do it to ensure that the um, revenue is sufficient to uh, fund the new bylaw, particularly the mandate for town inspections to obtain a permit. Right now, there are over 1,100 parcels that are permitted under the current system. Um, and so that would be 1,100 parcels to inspect every three years. Um, and so we are going to be, as we look at that fee schedule and structure and run numbers and look at numbers, looking really hard at how to make the new proposal sustainable from a, um, from a revenue and um, staffing point of view. Um, so, Andy. Well, thank you. You actually answered the third thing I was going to, uh, one of the three things I was going to say, saves time. Um, I, I had several uh, com comments and concerns about it, uh, this in general to at least have us be thinking about, and that was one of them, so thank you. Um, second is, is that I'm a little bit uncomfortable about everybody always talking about students, 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 even though we all do recognize that that is the largest number of renters, but it's not exclusive. I always think of the uh, television program of many years ago, Friends, um, where you had young adults who were living together and sharing, um, and uh, but they were not students. And so we shouldn't be writing things to assume um, a particular group, even if we know that there is a predominant group because of who lives, um, who's our biggest customers in town, what is our biggest business. And the last thing that um, I'm hoping that you'll think about and is reflected in some of the questions that I had sent to Mandy earlier is that um, I, I am concerned that this could increase costs to landlords to the point that they have to raise rents. And I'm very sensitive about rents. Um, I think it, it is really becoming very onerous on everybody who rents, students and non-students alike, uh, that rents, and to us to take an action that um, drives up uh, rents further um, is something that we should at least be thinking about. Thank you, Andy. Jennifer. Um, yes, I, I just, I have to respond. Um, nobody is, uh, anti-student, but, and I'm just talking about undergraduates, is this is, you think of, I guess Andy gave the, you know, example of friends, you know, they kept hours, the hours that were kept were, I'm sure, similar to the non-student household neighbors. And I think what 
is different with not all, but what people experience living, you know, when there gets to be a tipping point of too many houses rented to undergraduates, literally is the hours that are kept, which is, you know, when the bars close at two in the morning, there's a lot of activity, there's a lot of parties, there's a lot of cars, and you, it is, it, it, we just have to acknowledge it's a very different situation. And, you know, there was some huge parties this weekend because of the football game. And I know on one street, there was real mayhem, but none of the residents wanted to report it because everybody was like, it's a beautiful Saturday afternoon. Of course they should be having parties, but it, it, it did mean that other people on the block couldn't be out in their backyards enjoying the afternoon but you know it's just what you know kind you know how things are compatible in in a sense so i nobody um particularly those neighborhoods that are near the university people chose to live there because they love the vibrancy but there is a difference between the hours that are kept and and the lifestyles that just has to be recognized. Um, the other thing I did want to say in terms of, um, I know that some of the feedback from some of the landlords on the uh, on the forms was there was concern, and I'm not, I, I think anything should be done to make houses safer, even if it is installing a sprinkler system, but there was definitely some resistance to that. And I guess it will only be an issue if it's more than five living there because it's so costly to install, particularly in these, you know, larger, older houses. So I, you know, um, so I wonder if there would be some resistance to having to install the sprinkler systems, although they would have to do that given the occupancy. So I, I just wanted to clarify that it's just not fair to, um, to, to suggest that anybody is being anti-student, but we just, you know, uh, have to deal with, with what is, and there is a big difference. There's just totally di different between the hours. You know, graduate students keep the same hours as everyone else, but it's different. You know, we were all undergraduates and we had, a, you know, and we know, you know, what lifestyle is enjoyed. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. I wanna give an opportunity to Anika. I know she had her hand up and left it down. Um, if you want to ask a question or make a comment, you may, or, but don't feel you have to because you did take your hand down, but I wanted to make sure I asked. Oh, thank you, Mandy. I just wanted to thank Andy as well for, you know, seeing the broad range of renters here because, um, and acknowledging the economy because the rents have yet in most places of the country to go down. Um, and uh, yeah, so just it being inclusive of who our renters are. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we are basically out of time. Um, so what I would recommend or ask, what I ask of my fellow counselors is if you have any other questions after you go through this even further, um, send them to me. I will be trying to, as I said earlier, take some of the questions that we heard today to write up answers, the questions that Andy sent me to write up answers. Um, that can be distributed not only to CRC, but to the council so that you see sort of where we are going. I anticipate because we've been doing a lot of work that the next draft will not show up in a CRC packet until November 3rd at the earliest, um, which is the reason is the draft that is out there is the draft that CRC saw on the 20, on the 13th, um, the draft that we've been discussing tonight and the draft that will be discussed at the next meeting, the, the listening session next week that CRC is holding at 7 p.m., but it is also the draft that the attorney is going to be working with and discussing with CRC on the 27th of the month. And therefore, until we get all of that information back, I'm not going to produce a new draft because I'm going to try and incorporate all of that. I think it's going to be four different meetings 
into the new draft. So don't go, oh, it's going to be on the 27th. No, you're not going to see something new until the third at the earliest. Um, but so you've got time. Please send me any comments, questions you have. We'll try to incorporate them um, and answer them if it's appropriate to answer them or discuss them at a meeting. And potentially you'd see your incorporation of that comment into a further draft at some point. Um, I think at this point, Lynn, I turn it back over to you. Great. Thank you again, Mandy Joe, and all the members of CRC who have been working so hard on this and our staff who have been serious assets to uh, the work of this committee. Um, this is a good discussion. I hope you got what you wanted from it. Um, and with that, we're going to adjourn this and immediately go on to our next uh, meeting. Um, again, it's October 17th. Uh, we are... Um, uh, I'm going to call the council public forum together uh, at this point at 8.30. It's the second of three meetings tonight. Uh, we've already done a lot of checking with people uh, to make sure they can hear us and hear them and we can hear them. And so without spending any more time on that, I'd like to go right on to uh, Paul Bachelman and Finance Director Sean Mangano for a very brief presentation on the FY23 Supplemental Budget Appropriations, Transfers, and the creation of the Stabilization Fund. And then we will move to public comment. Great. Thank you, Lynn. Before the clock starts on our presentation, um, Sonia, are, are you here? I can't see you. Can you turn your camera on? There's okay. Sonia. Sonia. So, uh, I don't know where anybody else was on January 20th, 1987, but we had a new employee show up that day who was our new parking clerk and her name was Sonia Aldridge. And she has announced that she will be retiring in the near future. And I just wanted to let people know this because this is gonna be a momentous change. She has uh, rose from parking clerk, as you know, um, to ultimately becoming our, uh, uh, interim finance director and has done every job in the in the treasurer and collectors and accounting office in between. Um, she was keeping this. I think she was keeping that that finance director seat, Warren, because she always wanted to have Sean Mangano take over that job, and she was successful in making that happen. So um, there'll be a lot more to talk to Sonia about, but I just want to publicly announce that she had announced that she, her plans are to retire. Um, sometime next year. So we have time to recruit her. No one will replace her, but someone to help with us going forward. Sonia thank you, Sona. Sonia, thank you. You're welcome. It's been, it's been a long time. Bernie Kubiak said to me the other day that he thinks there should be a law that you're not allowed to retire. <laughs> thank I'm you. looking forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yep. You've got that beautiful property to spend time on. All right, thank you. Uh, so we're going to go on, Paul and Sean, and um, presentation. Yep. Sean will do the presentation. Thank you. Okay. Athena, can you um, enable share screen for me? All right, hopefully everybody can see this on the screen. So we just have one slide tonight. Sorry, right there. Um, so we have a number of financial orders that have been recommended to the council and reviewed by the finance committee. Uh, this table outlines them here and I'll go through them briefly. So the first order FY 23-04B is a request to increase operating budgets for the town and the school and the library by 351,938 or one half percentage point from what was already approved for FY 23. Uh, the funding source for this would be uh, state aid that came in higher than what was budgeted during uh, the FY23 process. And there's really two reasons that we're requesting this. Um, one, operating budgets, like, like everyone in the world right now, they're dealing with a lot of inflation. Um, our operating budgets are particularly vulnerable in the areas of um, utilities and fuel. And so this additional amount will help all the operating budgets deal with um, the impacts of inflation for this year that will hopefully subside in future years. Uh, the second major reason is that the schools and the library in particular have an, um, some new initiatives that are being funded that many would like to see continue to be funded um, on a more permanent basis. 
uh, for the town. It's the additional for uh, firefighters and EMTs that were added last year and are currently being funded through ARPA. At this uh, elementary school level, it is the uh, arts and technology positions and the collaboration time that was discussed during the FY23 budget process. And at the region, it's uh, some mental health programming that was added using ESSER funds. So all of these things are uh, things that we'd like to see continue and increase in our operating budgets will allow us to phase them in on a more permanent basis. The next two uh, orders, FY2305B and 05C, are capital appropriation requests, um, one for roads and sidewalks and one for the region track and field. Uh, the, the million dollars for roads and sidewalks is to address um, the backlog of repairs uh, for roads and sidewalks that we've all uh, become aware of. Um, when we have additional uh, free cash at the end of a year, we try to put some of that into the, the identified needs of the town, roads and sidewalks being one of them. Um, we did this last year and we're looking to do it again this year. Uh, the other one here is the region track and field. This is to help fund the larger project. Um, the, the council has already allocated 1.5 million to uh, through the region debt authorization to replace just the track. Um, the council has approved an 800,000 uh, CPA debt authorization. And this is the third and final leg of the funding plan that was put together by the regional school district to help fund the larger track and field uh, rehabilitation project that would turn the track um, and redo the field inside the track. And both of these are also being uh, funded through free cash that was generated from the FY22 budget. The next order, FY23-15, is proposing the creation of a capital stabilization fund. Currently, we just have a general stabilization fund that holds our reserves in addition to free cash. And one thing that's always been unclear, um, I think, to everybody is what portion of those reserves are to support the four building projects and capital, and what portion is just for economic uh, stability in, in case of a downturn. And so creating this fund, we feel, will aid in the planning process for the four building projects by uh, more clearly delineating what portion of our reserves are for what purpose. Um, going along with this uh, fund, we're also proposing a policy that would move any amount of reserves over 15% of the operating budget into the capital stabilization fund going forward after considering um, other commitments that have been made like the one for reparations. The next order, FY23-12A, is the order to, um, based on the commitment that the council made to fund reparations up to $2 million per year. And each year would be based on the amount of cannabis taxes collected or an amount equivalent to that, um, which is what you see here, $134,330. Um, this annual contribution is based on, uh, would only be made if the town was in good financial shape, which this year um, we're, we are. And the last two uh, orders, FY23-12A and uh, 14C, are based on that policy that I just uh, mentioned moving anything above 15% into the capital stabilization fund. So the first order would ultimately leave 5% in free cash and move the difference into the capital stabilization fund. And the second order would leave 10% in general stabilization and, and move the rest into uh, the capital stabilization fund. So what you'd be left with is 5% free cash, 10% in general stabilization to make a total of 15% of the operating budget. And then the balance, which is roughly um, 9.3 million, would be moved into the capital stabilization fund. And happy to answer any questions. Okay, this is actually an opportunity for people in the audience to ask questions and to uh, make comments. Uh, but before, I just want to clarify, um, it's 220,000 maximum per year for reparations, am I correct about that? So there's there's no maximum per year. It would be based on what we brought in okay. in cannabis tax revenue, but up to a, a maximum of $2 million. In Over the, 10 years. Yeah, right. okay. or as many years as it takes to get there, I think. Right, thank you, thanks. Um, Michelle, you had your hand up, was it about that? It is directly about that. Yeah, I think in the motion, it did say that it would be a maximum of 200 and okay. something or other. So I think Lynn's remembering correctly okay. on that one. Right. Thank you, Michelle. 
All right, with that, uh, again, this is public comment. We need to have public comment open now for until 6.48. Uh, so if you would like to make public comment about the transfers and the stabilization fund, the capital stabilization fund, are any of the items that Sean has just gone over, please raise your hand. Um, not seeing any hands, this could be a long time. Um, Public forums are a requirement of our charter uh, and the residents have up to half of the time to speak. Tony Cunningham, please enter the room. Hi, thanks, Tony Cunningham, Owen Drive. I had a question about the capital stabilization fund. The money says the source is free cash. Does that mean it will not be a borrowing and it will not, um, show up on our capital coming out of our capital budget it is okay if i go ahead and answer that one please yeah so um the two orders for capital stabilization um, moving funds into capital stabilization fund those are taking funds that we already have and it's really just moving it from one type of reserve account to another so it's it's moving funds from a general reserve to a reserve specific to capital. So there would be no borrowing involved. It's it's money that's um, been accrued over many years. Okay, uh, Andy. Before we go any further, I just need to have you quickly call the finance committee meeting to order, and recognize Bob Hegner. I do so. Uh, call the committee to order, and Bob, you want to just confirm your presence? I'm here. <clears throat> Thank you. I think those are the only people that are not counselors. All right. Are there other questions or comments? There's 12 people in the audience on the Zoom, probably a lot more in the audience on um, Amherst Media, but we don't know what that number is. These are questions regarding are um, appropriations outside the annual budget. And this is done once a year at the time that we have free cash and it's been certified. Are there any other public comments? We have six more minutes to go. is about it as exciting as the first time we had public comment. Tony Cunningham, please enter the room. You need to unmute. Hi, thank, thank you. Uh, just to follow on from that comment, thank you, Sean, for that answer. Um, I'm just curious with the, the track and field project, when it goes ahead and the amount is borrowed, in paying the debt service on that borrowing, will some of it come out of that capital stabilization rather than, I'm just trying to, how will we see it, you know, as far as the capital budget versus this capital stabilization fund, will the payments come out of both? Thank you. Right, yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, so for the region track and field project, it's gonna be a little more complicated because there's, there's three funding sources and possibly a fourth depending on, um, if there's donations and fundraising that that goes uh, that, that's generated, um, so for this this nine hundred thousand dollars that's being proposed to, um, tonight, this is just um, this is from free cash, so it's almost like cash capital. Um, so this will be a capital project that is created that will be called the Region Track and Field, um, and it will it won't be a borrowing authorization. It will just be a pot of funding for that project, and those funds that 900,000 specifically will either be spent through 
um, bills being sent to the town directly for our share of that project, or it may be a reimbursement to the region of some sort for their work. We'll, we'll work on what administratively makes the most sense. Um, the CPA portion, which was a uh, borrowing authorization, that will be, it, it'll work in a similar way, but that is a borrowing authorization that we would pay back over many years. Um, I think we're estimating 10 years with the CPA committee. And then the uh, region, the first action, which was the region debt authorization for 1.5 million, that comes to us as an assessment each year. It comes out of the, the pot of capital money that we have um, and it's assessed to us each year. So the region incurs the debt in that circumstance and then they give a piece to each of their member towns um, and we pay it through, again, through a uh, capital assessment as opposed to our operating assessment. So because this project has a variety of funding sources, it'll be a little more complicated than a regular capital project. Um, but uh, Sonia's here. She does a great job of keeping track of all the different funding sources. Thank you. Are there other questions or comments? It's 645. We have three more minutes that will be open for this public forum. I'm looking for any final comments from people regarding the um, appropriations outside the annual budget. Andy, unless you see any reason not to, I think in just a moment, I'm going to have you adjourn the finance committee meeting, but just hold on a moment. Andy, you can go ahead. I adjourn the finance committee meeting. Okay. And the public forum is now adjourned, but we will immediately move on to the regular town council meeting. Okay. We've already gone through making sure everybody can hear us and we can hear them. Uh, and as far as I can tell, we've not lost any counselors uh, in connectivity. Uh, again, this meeting is being held virtual. Given that we have a quorum of the council present, I'm calling the regular town council meeting to order at 6.48. Um, we will have an opportunity for public comment during this time as well. We're going to go on to the next uh, item on the agenda, which is announcements. We have a lot of meetings come up, coming up. I wanna just call attention to a few. First of all, on November 7th, I'm sorry, Pam, you have your hand up. Hi, uh, just curious, is there not an opportunity to ask questions on the, uh, the presentation of the finance report? There will be an opportunity, and if there is a specific item 
that you want to ask questions about, then you're going to need to have it pulled off the consent agenda. Okay, but there will also be a finance committee report toward the end of the evening, okay? Um, so on November 7th, um, we have a very variety of different meetings. First of all, the town council does receive the evaluations from each of the other counselors. And we then also receive the first draft of the memo regarding the town manager's valuation. That leads to a reading period. If counselors want to have that reading period and they want to be at their computer, all materials can be sent to you. They can also ask that they would be sent to you or brought to your home or brought to you here in the town room in printed form. And that reading period goes from five to seven. At seven o'clock, we'll actually have a special town council meeting, which is joint with the library and library trustees and the school committee. And that's to actually be our official kickoff of the FY24 budget uh, and the financial indicators. And then at about eight o'clock, we will return to our regular town council meeting. That council meeting will include a tax classification hearing. Although tonight we will hear a few items about the tax classification. I also want to point out on November 21st at six o'clock, we will have the official public forum for the FY24 budget. And then we will also have a regular town council meeting. Uh, Mandy Jo mentioned this, but I want to mention it again. On the 24th, the community forum um, is being held on the residential rental bylaws. And that's actually a time for residents to ask questions and engage in that dialogue. And this is one of two that we've had this year. The other one, I believe, was back in August. Um, and then on the 18th, uh, the Finance Committee is meeting, and we will be looking at all of the capital projects and the financial model again. That is a joint meeting with the Town Council. Uh, it's called so that if enough, if there are seven or more counselors, we will call that meeting. There are two district meetings coming up. One is on the 23rd at the Amherst History Museum. That's District 4, and that's one for one to three. The other one is District 2, which was rescheduled. It's now on the 26th at 6.30 via Zoom. And if you'll go to the next, there's also the announcement of the AHRA listing session, which is being held in person at the Hitchcock Center from 6.30 to 8 p.m. on October 27th. I think you can find a meeting to go to if you're looking. Andy, you have a question? Is that a question? I just wanted to uh, say that tomorrow, the 18th, when we have the Finance Committee Council combined meeting and major agenda item will be the, uh, as you said, the four capital projects. Uh, we will not uh, in a promise not to reach that item until 3.30. We'll be handling other business before then, so anybody, of course, everybody's welcome to join the meeting for its entirety, but if you're trying to join just for the capital projects, I just wanted to let you know that 3.30 is when we uh, are intending to reach that item. Thank you. Okay, we are going to, um, we do not have any hearings tonight, but we do, uh, Shalini, you have your hand up. Can I just make a quick announcement for the South Asian fall festival sure thank you and i will be sending a formal invite to the counselors and all our committees but i just wanted everyone to mark the calendars for november 5th saturday from 3 30 to 6 p.m i've uh, been working with the community members to create a south asian fall festival okay. details to be follow and thank where you. will that be located What's that? Where will that be located? It's going to be at the Unitarian Church downtown. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, we're now going to go on to general public comment. If you would like to make public comment, please raise your hand now. Let's 
So far, I'm not seeing any hands. I'll give it another minute. Okay, we're going to go on to the consent agenda. Uh, the consent agenda will be up on the screen. The following items were selected because they were considered to be routine and it was reasonable to expect they would pass with no controversy. To remove an item after you, you go through this, I go through the motion, you tell me which item you're going, you want to remove, and I will remove that as we look for a second. So um, to move the following items and the printed motions there under and approve those items as a single unit. Eight a, let me just mention, you don't have to remove the entire 8A. If you want to remove something under 8A, you can do so. Approval of the following financial orders. FY23-04B, Supplemental Operating Budget. FY23-05B, Capital Improvement Program Roads and Sidewalks. FY23-05C, Capital Improvement Program, School Track and Field. FY23 12A free cash to stabilization fund, FY23 14C stabilization to capital stabilization fund, FY23 15 establish, establish a cap a stabilization fund for the purposes of capital. Um, 8B authorization of the November 8th, 2022 election warrant. 8C, referral of proposed changes to recently adopted bylaw 3.39, street numbering of buildings to governance organization and legislation committee. 8D, authorization for the town council president to sign the letter to the UMass Amherst Chancellor Search Committee on behalf of the town council. And 11A, approval of the following town council meeting minutes, October 3rd, 2022 regular town council meeting minutes. I'll recognize Dorothy Pam at this time. I'd like to remove um, FY2305C capital improvement program, school track and field. Okay. Is there anything else or anybody else who has a request at this time? See none, then I'm seeking a second for the consent agenda shown on your screen. Alicia, second. I'm sorry, Alicia. Alicia? I think she's stuck in the audience. Oh, were you seconding it? She's in the attendees. She's in the attendees. Oh. Uh, can you bring Alicia back over, please? Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Yes, I was in the audience, but I will second that also. Thank you. <laughs> and welcome back. Thank um, you. Okay. No other questions. We're going to move to the vote. We're going to start with... Uh, Aunt Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Lynn Griesmers and I, Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane is absent. Uh, Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Aye. Alicia Walker. Aye. Shalini Balmil. Yes. It's unanimous, 12 in favor and one absent. Uh, thank you. We are now going to move on to um, the tax. Uh, we have no resolutions and proclamations tonight. Uh, I'd like to welcome Sean Mangano back along with Assessor Kim Muse, and they are going to do a brief presentation on the tax classifications that will, are being proposed this year. We will not be voting on this item tonight. Sean? Yeah, thank you. So um, unlike la past years uh, where we just had the hearing and then the vote the same night, we wanted to, A, because we wanted to do this a little earlier, do a sort of a workshop um, and go through much of the presentation that you usually um, receive and have some time for um, questions and answers. And th that way we can also bring back um, responses to any questions at the actual hearing um, in November. So I will turn it over to our principal assessor, Kim Yu, who will lead us through the presentation. 
evening, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. So um, we're just gonna quickly go through this. I won't spend a whole lot of time on all of this since we'll look at this again um, at the next council meeting, but um, just to start off, what we will be voting on on the 7th is whether or not we do a single or a split tax rate, um, whether we do the open space discount, a small commercial exemption and a residential um, exemption. Next slide, please. Um, so how this process works for those of you who are new to the council is um, once we have our assessments finalized and once we get that approval from the state, so we have our values approved, uh, we can have a public hearing where the council will vote on these items, the split tax rate, the residential exemption, um, the small commercial exemption, and the open space discount. Um, and then once um, we have this, this, um, this vote, then we can recommend to you. Um, although it's not a uh, necessity for the town manager and or the assessor and board to make recommendations, we generally do make our recommendation to you. Next slide, please. And this slide it looks like a lot of information. Um, it's basically just the wording right out of the chapter um, explaining the process of what this situation is. So pretty much what I've just explained to you. So we can skip right over this slide for now. Um, and so this classification act has been an ongoing thing since 1978. Um, it requires that municipalities classify their property under um, residential, commercial, industrial, and personal property. And some communities also have open space here in Amherst. We do not have that. We use the chapter land um, instead. And if you go on to the next slide, I will explain what these classes are. Um, so we have the residential class, which I think is pretty common that pretty much everybody knows, but basically it's uh, any property um, such as single family homes. Um, you can do one or two two family, three family, so on and so forth. Basically any residence, any place that um, someone can live. Um, this also includes vacant land, um, accessory buildings, um, things such as swimming pools and tennis courts, uh, any, basically anything that would be involved with a single or a uh, residence. Um, then you also have your commercial class and this is uh, businesses such as stores, offices, um, uh, hotels, as you can see here, um, and it also includes vacant land, and here's where your chapter would come into play, and chapter land is farmland um, and recreational land, and then you have your um, industrial properties, and this is basically any manufacturing, which Amherst has very little of, uh, and then lastly is your personal property. This is anything, basically, if you can pick up the building and shake it out, if it would fall out on the ground, it's personal property. Um, so this can be um, any sort of um, desks, computers, things of that nature. Um, and so if you, I just wanted to also note, if you see anywhere in the presentation or in anything that I've given you that says CIP, you'll see here, it stands for commercial, industrial, and personal property. We can go on to the next slide, please. I just wanna this acknowledge here, Kim, excuse me, I just want to acknowledge for a moment that uh, two members of the Board of Assessors are in the audience. The chair, I believe, is Richard Morris and uh, Lee Hines. If you at any point would like to make a comment, please raise your hand. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay, so you will see this graph here, this um, pie chart here. Uh, so this is just a breakdown of what our town looks like. Um, so we have 6,938 total parcels. And so you'll see most of those parcels are made up with our residential class. Um, you'll see that's 88%. You'll see the 6.5 under commercial, 4.4 under personal property, and then very, very small, less than 1% of the industrial parcels. So um, just keep this graph, this, um, pie chart in mind when we talk about the residential exemption. Um, so we can go on to the next slide, please. Um, so this is one of the things that we're going to be voting on on the 7th. 
And this is the split versus single tax rate. Um, so basically what this means is that if we do a factor of one, which means a single tax rate, um, everybody will be paying the same rate. So for example, last year we had a rate of 21.27 per thousand. Um, and so if we decide that we want to do a split tax rate, um, that would be a factor of less than one. And basically what happens here is the, um, generally speaking with the, with the factor of one, of, of less than one, excuse me, uh, the, the commercial class will pay a higher rate. And if we do a factor of less, greater than one, um, the, the residential um, properties would be paying a greater rate, which is not very common. Um, you'll see in a later slide, I have a little um, comment on that. So, um, but basically what I want to make sure that you know is that when you do the split tax rate, you are shifting the burden of who pays more of the tax um, between the two classes. So um, commercial versus the, uh, excuse me, the commercial industrial and personal property versus the residential class. Um, we can go to the next slide. And this just gives you an example. Um, this is using last year's information because we don't yet have our tax rate set for this year. Uh, so I figured I would use actual figures. So I apologize for not having that information just yet. Um, so for the average single family home from last year, you will see um, at a single tax rate, the value, the taxes would have been $9,593, whereas the average commercial um, tax would have been $10,232.40. And then you'll see where I gave the example underneath of the split tax rate. So the um, average single family would have been just over, just under 9,000 and the commercial would have been just over 15,000. So a difference of almost 600 and just over $1,000 in tax, um, depending on whether we wanna do the split tax rate or the single tax rate. Um, so you can go on to the next slide. So just some facts about single tax rate. There are 351 communities in Massachusetts and 239 of those have a single tax rate as of fiscal year 2022. 108 of those communities decided to do the single or the split tax rate with rates shifting from 22 cents to $21.34 above the residential rate. So again, that's just saying that the commercial class is paying a much higher rate uh, than the commercial, I'm sorry, than the residential. Um, and then there were six odd communities who decided to have the commercial and industrial and personal property pay a lesser rate than the residential uh, class. So, and that was ranging from 29 cents to 79 cents higher uh, for, the for the residential class. Um, so something to keep in mind, again, thinking about our pie chart that I had given you, um, generally when you're doing a split tax rate, you want to have your personal property, industrial, and commercial class be 70-30 uh, ratio to your um, residential. Um, so hearing that and thinking about ours, we're about 88 to 12. So we're not quite in the best shape to do that with. Um, so it, it, you want to think about the difficulties that it could raise for the commercial class. I know that it's important to think about the residential as well, um, but we certainly don't wanna push out all of our, our commercial classes when we don't have very many as it is. So just something to think about. Um, so with that being said, um, myself and um, Paul, the town manager, would recommend that we do a, a factor of one, meaning a split, uh, excuse me, a single tax rate. You can go on to the next slide, please. And this is the residential exemption. So here's another vote that we'll be having on the 7th. And basically this is a very similar um, aspect to the split tax rate. So what this is going to be doing is specifically in the residential class, this would be shifting the burden for um, owners who are non-owner occupied properties. Um, so again, I just want to make sure that, that you are aware that it is not shifting to the commercial, industrial, and personal property class, rather shifting inside of the residential class. So this would have a higher tax 
um, for those that are non-owner occupied. Um, I know there's a lot of wording on here, but basically it's just explaining that the highest percentage that can be given is the 35% of the um, average value of all residential properties. Um, and again, just explaining that it's the shift of the burden inside of the residential class. Um, so if you go to the next slide, please. This next slide explains the qualifications for the residential exemption. So as I had mentioned, um, it's an owner occupied status to receive this exemption. Single family homes, condominiums, part of mixed use as well as two and three family homes can also be um, um, qualify for this, this exemption. Um, and what it means by part of a two or three family home or part of a mixed use property is if you have a two or three family home and you're the owner and you live in one of the units, uh, we would make a calculation based on that unit and your portion of the units would be, um, would qualify for the residential exemption as well as the mixed use property. So if you have a building that has, um, for example, office space as well as uh, livable units and you live in one of those units, you would qualify for that portion of the building. Something to keep in mind that is really important um, is the properties that would be excluded from this exemption. Um, obviously, as I had mentioned, non-owner occupied, um, second homes and rentals, which I know is important for people, but also homes that are rented by family members, but those family members are not necessarily on the deeds. Um, so, so parcels that you'd wanna think about are elderly people, who have um, given their children their property, uh, their, their residence. However, they still live there, they still pay all the bills, they just put the property in their children's name. Those people would not qualify for the residential exemption. Um, those who put their property in trusts would also not qualify. It doesn't matter who you are, why you did it, who's the trustee, it doesn't matter. If it's a property in a trust, it does not qualify. Um, apartment buildings and then um, nursing homes and group homes would also not qualify for the residential exemption. Next slide. Kim, please. can I just add one quick thing? Um, yes. While you're going through the residential exemption, um, some of you may remember we did a very detailed presentation last year just on the residential exemption um, where we did a survey to get sort of best numbers on owner occupied versus non owner occupied. Um, and we did some sort of scenarios of what it would look like and what it would mean. Um, and we will, Kim and I will make sure that that presentation gets redistributed to everybody um, if you wanna take a look at it. Thank you. Yes, and so along those lines, um, this information here on this pie chart is actually um, from that survey that we had done um, in 22. So you'll see that out of the residential class, we have 66% that's owner occupied and 34% that is not. So whether that is um, student rentals or just in general rentals for families, um, that we don't know, but at least we have this, this percentage here. And the thing to remember with this slide is that this is parcels or, or housing, um, uh, taxable housing units. Um, it's not residents, right? The residents and the non-owner occupied, there's probably a bigger portion of residents in that smaller slice. Um, we don't know exactly how many are in that slice, but this is just the parcel itself. Yes. And you can go to the next slide, please. And so this is just a quick summary. Um, just again, a reminder that if we do the residential exemption, um, it is a shift of the tax burden inside of the residential class. So again, with the split tax rate, we'd be shifting um, to the commercial, industrial, and personal property, whereas the residential exemption would just shift inside of the residential class. Um, and we do want to keep in mind, again, about those renters, um, those people who rent apartment buildings, uh, or not specifically the whole building, but um, units in the apartment building, um, anyone who rents condos, anybody who rents at all. Um, this could affect their monthly rent based on um, if these increase. And we also want to think about those, um, again, who may have their house in their children's name or their, their um, 
you know, siblings or, or any family members as well as trusts. Um, so this could put an increase on their, their rent. And then um, you can go to the next slide, please. And this would be um, another thing that we'll be voting on on the 7th. So this is the small commercial exemption. Um, basically what the intention of this is, is to give smaller businesses um, a break on their taxes. And um, this is not something that I would recommend only because we have a smaller commercial class here in Amherst. Um, and so at this point, it's shifting again, the tax burden in the commercial class. So very similar to the residential. Um, so I don't think that this would be uh, beneficial to us, particularly just because we have only about a 12% commercial um, class in Amherst. And he, with that being said, we do have many small businesses as well. So um, this also may just keep in mind that this could potentially hurt um, the slightly larger businesses that we do have here in Amherst. And I don't have a slide on the open space because we don't have that here in Amherst. So the, the recommendation on that would be to um, not do the open space. Um, and so what I do wanna mention is I apologize that I couldn't give you uh, this year's figures on some of these slides because we don't have our tax rate set. Uh, but what I can tell you is that I do anticipate our tax rate to decrease because we have had quite a bit of growth um, in Amherst this year. So I am anticipating our tax rate to go down. Um, so with that said, uh, basically our recommendations this year are to um, adopt the single tax rate as a factor of one and not to adopt the residential, small commercial or open space uh, exemptions. Thank you. So we're going to have a period of brief questions and then uh, there will be some slight change in the order, order of the agenda. Pam Rooney, go ahead. That's so yeah. un unmuting, thanks. Um, in, in this process without getting really into the weeds, but um, how is a commercial property actually evaluated or assessed uh, is income included in that in that formula? Um, and then the the reason for asking that is that we have lots of structures, lots of structures in Amherst that are purchased for investment purposes, um, and they're operating as a business. They write off expenses. Can we treat them as a business? And you all understand that I'm talking about rental units. So um, when we talk about the definition of a, of a residential building or business and a commercial business, um, I, I would challenge us to think more broadly about what is a commercial business. And I'd love to hear some pretty specific feedback on, on why that could work. Yes, so thank you for that question. So um, the commercial properties are uh, both commercial as well as apartment buildings can uh, be used the, excuse me, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble talking today. Um, the, the income and expense can be used to create the value. Um, we do run that study to make sure that the value um, is not going to be a, a lesser value than the fair market value. So using sales and comparable buildings. Um, so we do run both of those to make sure, again, that that we're picking the correct value. Um, when it comes to um, classifying basically um, commercial versus a residential unit that's being um, rented, understandably that some people are using those for profit and that is their livelihood. Um, however, the Department of Revenue classifies commercial property uh, completely different than residential, regardless of what the what's happening in the residential parcel. Uh, for example, a single family or a two family, it's a residence. So if we were to use income and expense methods on uh, two, th 
three, four, or even five families um, and, and single families, we would have to use that method across the board. So we can't pick and choose um, you know, which, which single families get that particular method. Um, and it's also extremely difficult to value um, a building lesser than uh, four or more apartments using the income and expense method. Um, I have actually heard this comment in the past and I've mentioned it to our rep from the Department of Revenue and I could feel the glaring eyes through the phone at me saying, no, this is not okay. <laughs> um, so, you know, unfortunately that's, that's a tough situation where um, we are very restricted to how we can value these particular parcels. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Kim, maybe you can just clarify for the, but for the larger um, apartment complexes, we do use the income and expense method um, yes. for their valuations because um, yes. there's not a lot of comparable sales to look at for, for large, um, you know, you know, 50, 60 unit um, developments. Yes. Uh, Dorothy, oh, I'm sorry. Did you have a follow-up question? Yeah, Pam? Just a follow-up. Um, and, and part of the reason I ask is that is that there are literally websites out there that that teach people how to buy investment property, and especially in college towns. So we have this huge target of of investment dollars. It is it's exacerbated by the fact that we have 19,000 students that can't find housing on campus. So they have to live somewhere, and it is—it's um, such a different economic factor. I really, really would, would challenge us to figure out how that non-owner occupied, where it applies, process could really take a different look at this issue. I think it's—it's it's something that. Um, it's an industry in town, it's an income base, and I really would like some support on this. I think it's really important. Thank you. And and quickly following up on that, Pam, we have looked at that. Um, I think I was the reason why Kim talked to the DOR because I asked her to to run an analysis comparing the um, uh, the sales method of valuing property versus the income method for some smaller um, units. and. And the results varied pretty widely. In some cases, they were very close, and some they were not very close. And um, and so it is something we've looked into a little bit, and we'll continue to look into. But um, we can't really find anybody who's doing it, uh, Kim. Unless you've come across anybody since we looked at it last, um, can't find anyone who's doing it. And the DOR kind of gave, you know, as Kim mentioned, um, didn't seem overly supportive of it. But it, it, we'll continue to look at it. Is what I'll say. Dorothy. Because you can't do what Pam asked you to do, then why wouldn't it seem to be an obvious thing to do the non-owner occupied to do the owner occupied exemption? Because I, I I believe that research shows that a town needs a certain percentage of owner occupied houses in order to have some kind of stability um, of residence, and um, I think that would be something that would be good. So that's my question. Why wouldn't that be an obvious thing to do? So, I mean, I think you have to ask yourself, why do you want to do the residential exemption? So what would be the the reason for it? Um, you know, when we did the survey, you know, we try to hypothesize what might be the reason. And one of the, the reasons we thought would be to give, um, you know, maybe lower income residents a break. And what we kind of came around to is that there's no guarantee that's going to happen with the residential exemption. In fact, it might have the opposite effect. So um, the residential exemption does not take into account income. It's just based on property value. Um, so there's no guarantee we're helping those with the lowest ability to pay. Um, and I think we had legitimate concerns that it would really impact rents, which we thought would be an, an adverse outcome for renters. Um, you know, there were some when we did the survey we looked at just a 15% residential exemption, so not even the max. And there were some um, developments that saw a $50,000 increase in their taxes per year. Um, and that's like a not at the max, so it could be much more depending on what would actually be uh, put into place. So we had major concerns that it could increase rents and that it would have the sort of opposite outcome for sort of the, the, the ones in town with the lowest ability to pay. So again, that's why I've come back to if, 
if that's something that the council really wants us to look into, we'd want to know sort of what are the motive, what are the, the goals of the program or the, the intentions of the program so we can kind of vet out whether it achieves those goals. So just one follow-up. Um, I could not follow the argument. So, I mean, obviously the goal from, from my point of view would be to um, support owner-occupied houses uh, of, of all levels. And you're saying that somehow this somehow would not work out to help them. So I would just love to see some kind of more detail on how that works out. Yeah, so just following up again, I would ask Dorothy, is, is, the, is the intent just to support lower valued owner-occupied homes? If that is, if that's the only goal of the program, um, then the residential exemption would achieve that. Um, again, if, it, if the goal was to provide some sort of relief to lower income individuals in town, um, then I'm not sure it would achieve that outcome. And if I may, um, I also think something to think about um, that I had mentioned with those properties that would not qualify that are owner occupied would be um, those seniors who have put their property in a trust and or someone else's name to um, you know, help them out in whichever way that was helping them. So it's just, if, if there is gonna be an outreach, I think that might be one of the questions that um, we ask because how many of those people would actually be benefiting from this that are now not going to benefit. And that's a real um, that's a real scenario that actually happened when we did the survey last year. We had a gentleman come in and say, you know, I you know I don't live in the home, but I am on the deed and I provide the home for my family. Um, you know, would would this impact me? And it would because it, in that case, the owner of the uh, the residence did not live in the in the residence, so they would not qualify for the exemption. Michelle. Yeah, I thought this may be a good um, or a possible solution to some some of our concerns, but um, I really hear what you're saying, Kim, and just wanting to clarify that um, the increase in rent comes because it would flow through from the landlord to the tenant, correct? That would be the assumption, yes. Okay. And that may be another one of those things that if we do another outreach, something that we might ask those landlords if they would pass that on. I mean, you don't see why they wouldn't, but certainly if, if there is going to be another outreach, I would say that that would be a great thing to add to it. Okay, great. And then the other question I had is, do we have any data from other communities that are that have used this? And do we know if it's been successful? What sorts of challenges um, have those communities run into? Um, and are they even, you know, similar communities, obviously? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I did an outreach uh, last year around this time, and I spoke with a couple of communities that had done this. Um, one in particular actually had a very seasoned assessor who had been in many, many communities. Um, he honestly had nothing good to say about this, mm -hmm. um, but I can go into more detail, I think, at another time if we want to, um, just not to take up too much time, but I'd love to answer your question, um, I'd be happy to send you emails with um, correspondence that I had with this particular assessor mm -hmm. and others as well. But um, but yes, I have spoke with some um, and I've heard not great feedback from the assessors on this particular. Um, just to sort of briefly touch the surface, um, you know, to start this out, it's a huge process. Um, you have to think about staffing in the assessor's office, especially hours where we only have myself and one other part-time, a uh, full-time person and then a part-time person. Um, and then there's just the upkeep. So do you need a new system to, to track this? Um, do you have to send something out each year? Um, so on and so forth. So just a few things to touch the surface of um, what would need to be done, what would need to be put in place to set this up. Thank you, Kim. Okay. Mandy Jo. Yeah, um, I encourage the new counselors to look closely at the presentation that we received last year. For example, um, I pulled that presentation up. 10% of owner-occupied parcels would actually receive an increase in taxes, in their property taxes, because of how this happens, um, because there's a break-even point, um, which was not discussed today, but, but there is. So we have approximately, from last year's presentation, 4,300 or so owner-occupied parcels, and 
over 430 of them would receive an increase in property taxes, despite an exemption um, of 15%. And the only example they gave us was 15%. Um, and then those non-owner non occupied parcels all receive an increase. And yes, the bulk of that increase is zero to $1,000, but some of them were over $10,000 a year in an increase in property taxes, as Sean said. And so it's hard to justify um, doing that when, especially when we pretty much know that that increase in property taxes every year would go to, on the non-owner occupied side, to the tenants that we're trying to already reduce rent from. Because we heard when we went from 100 to $250 on a residential rental permit, what did we hear? All the comments we've heard in that and anything we've heard right now as we discuss this are, it's going to be passed on to the tenants. It's going to be passed on to the tenants. And so if you're increasing a property tax $1,000 a year, $3,000 a year, $5,000 a year, $50,000 a year, someone's got to pay it and it's going to be the tenants. And so our rental housing stock will become even less affordable if we do something like this than it is now. Okay. Are there any other comments or questions at this time? Again, next on the, on the 7th of November, we will have a hearing on the tax proposed tax rates, and then we will vote that night as a council. Dorothy. I'll just point out that many homeowners have been saying they don't see what they're paying their taxes for, and they're getting feeling they're being taxed, but not being given or allowed to have safe and quiet neighborhoods and the enjoyment of their own property. So there has been a lot of complaints, people volunteering it. So you should know that. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments or questions on this item? Lynn, uh, Richard Morris has his hand up in the audience. Yes, Richard, please enter the room and tell us what you'd like to say. Thank you. Um, uh, can you hear me? We can. Okay. Um, you know, one of the things that's happened on the Board of Assessors is that we look at, um, we in executive session look at uh, the finances of people in town uh, to provide exemptions on their property taxes for seniors and uh, the blind and uh, veterans. And so, and when you look at people's finances, you can see how difficult um, paying their property taxes is for a lot of people in town or for, for a significant number of people in town. So the assessors um, have, you know, we develop a, a certain degree of empathy here for taxpayers. Um, but, and I, and so I'm sympathetic to what um, Ms. Pam has said, but we're limited by the, 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 the instruments of under the law that the state provides us. And unfortunately, the residential exemption is not an appropriate uh, instrument to do what we really want to do, which is provide some relief to lower income people in the town, because it simply doesn't um, allow us to sort of carve, carve things up in that way to provide to sort of shift the burden to people who are better able to pay uh, because what we do, what we would do under an exemption for uh, owners of homes would ultimately affect pretty starkly, I think, lower income people who are renters. So I, I, there, I don't think there's any, there's no uh, interest in ignoring the concerns that Ms. Pam has raised, but under the law, with the limited instruments we have, we simply don't have a way to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. And I want to thank all three of you um, for your service on this committee. I mean, this board. Um, is there any other questions from the council at this time? Okay, we're going to take a very brief five minute break. Don't go yet. When we come back, we're going to move on to the joint uh, discussion with the Community Safety and Social Justice Committee. Item 7B will follow after the action items of which we only have one based on the item that was pulled from the consent agenda. And then we will also 
do item 7B and 7D at the end of actions. So a five minute break, but don't put up the break sign because I wanna use this time to bring in all of the members of the um, CSSJC who are in the audience, okay? If counselors wanna take a brief break, turn off your videos, turn off your sound. Okay, so um, Deborah Ferreira needs to come in. Are you with me, Athena? Okay. Demetria Chabaz. Um, Philip Avila. Avila. Um, Dee, can you look at the uh, attendees and tell me if I'm missing anybody, please? Ah, oh, there's Pat on Abaku. Thank you. Yeah, that's what I was trying to do. Maybe not everyone's on here. So, Miss Pat, Deborah, um, where's Allegra? Allegra. Yeah, Allegra. Hello. There's Allegra. Okay. And Philip. Philip's there. Yeah, he's on. He's on. And oh, okay. oh, yeah. And Freke. So, Freke. yes, everyone is here. Okay. Is okay. Freke in, uh, promoted to a panelist, though? He has been. Oh, okay. Great. I don't see him yet, though. You have to tr push the blue arrow because we're now to the point that we have more people. Oh, and got it, it, got on it. The screen, thank yep. you. Okay, we're going to resume the meeting in a few minutes, uh, but welcome. And when we resume the meeting, we will have uh, the chairs call the CSSJC committee to order and make sure that everybody can hear and be heard. As counselors return from their very brief break, please turn on your video so that we can see that you're back. As you return, please turn on your video to make sure we know that you are back. Okay, we're just waiting for Alicia. Just let us know that you're back with your voice. Yes, I am here. Thank you. Okay, Anika, you are back. And Mandy Jo, just let us know you're back with your voice. I'm present. Thank you. Okay. Um, we are have agreed to have a joint meeting with the CSSJC for one hour uh, so that we will continue this discussion till approximately 840. 
because we have many other items to still do tonight on our agenda. Um, I would like to call upon uh, Allegra Clark and Deisha Boz, who are the co-chairs of the CSSJC, to call their meeting to order and to make sure that their members can hear us and we can hear them. Um, this is, excuse me, a meeting of the Community Safety and Social Justice Committee. And it is 7.39 p.m. Um, I'm sorry, I'm gonna take a sip of water. <laughs> Um, I'm going to call on the participants of our meeting to make sure everyone can be heard. Um, starting with my co-chair, Dee Shabazz. Yes. Thank you, Dee. Um, Philip Avila. Yes. Thank you, Philip. Uh, Pat Onanibaku. Yeah. Thank you. Deborah Ferreira. Here. And Freke Ete. Present. Okay, thank you. Um, we have two reports that have been provided to all members of the CSSJC and the council. They remain, they are in the packet. They are from Chief Police, Chief of Police Scott Livingstone. And the other one is an amend addendum to the initial report that was made by DEI Director Pamela Young. I'm going to call on each of them to give a brief um, presentation of their report. Um, and then we will move to discussion of questions and discussions at that time. So uh, Chief Livingstone. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I believe everybody has the report. Um, would you like it read? Um, Madam Chair, to get it on record officially, or how would you like to proceed on that? I can explain that that report uh, that was submitted to the Human Rights Commission was in addition to the original finding of the investigating officer in the July 5th incident, Lieutenant Bill Menard, and that was a synopsis and an overview of what had occurred and what we found out from the incident on July 5th but I'm more than happy to read it if you want to get it on record. Is there anybody who feels that the rate, that the report needs to be read at this time? Please raise your hand. I'm not seeing any. Uh, then we'll move on to Pamela Young. Hi, so I would like to focus on a key points of few key points in response to some questions raised uh, on the August 15th town council meeting that I feel are important to reiterate for this evening. Um, the first is that the Amherst Police Department officers work pursuant to a collective bargaining agreement and that that contract predates the DEI director position. And as a result, the DEI department is not authorized to conduct an independent investigation of the police department of its officers. The initial report that was filed for the August 15th meeting was based on information that was provided by the police department. The addendum that you received tonight is based on additional information from the police department, a letter from one of the parents and two anonymous letters, one from parents and the other one from uh, the teens that were involved. After I received the letter from the parent, I communicated with the parent and offered to meet in person with that individual. Um, that offer was declined. As the newly hired DEI director, this incident has been a challenging one um, and very informative as well. I think it's important for the council and the community to know that I take my responsibility assisting the town manager, the town's elected and appointed officials, staff, departments, and community members seriously. I've tried to bring my personal values to the position, uh, a personal commitment to advancing equity, uh, integrity, an awareness that the work is very complex, that it's challenging, it's emotional, and it is ongoing. And with that said, I, I would like to read into the yes. record my closing observations um, that are included in the addendum. 
Some of the youths and families involved in the July 5th police interaction have expressed feelings of harm. No one is in a position to die another's feeling. We can all agree the patrolman's statement to the minors regarding their individual rights was incorrect. As the town moves to be a safe and welcoming community, based on mutual respect for all, harm will occur, but reconciliation is possible. As a community, we must have the courage to admit a mistake, act to correct it, the strength to do the hard work of reconciliation and have the capacity to forgive and show grace. Included in the addendum or as a footnote are, are the values that you as a community have voted to embody. And I would just like to direct everyone's attention to those as we continue on the work that we lies ahead. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Um, Ms. Dr. Young. Um, the floor is now open for questions or comments regarding these two police reports. And those would be questions or comments from either members of the CSSJC or the town council. Uh, Dee Shabazz. Thank I, you. I'm, I'm gonna ask that people try to contain their comments to two to three minutes so that everybody gets a chance. Thank you. Yes, thank you, uh, Lynn. And thank you, Pam and Chief Livingstone for um, providing more information. Um, however, I believe that both statements amount to the standard language we see used by police to protect their officers without real accountability or reform, especially regarding the most vulnerable in our community, which are our youth, they're all our children. And again, to reiterate as a CSSJC, uh, it's important to establish an independent civilian review board with subpoena power, as we see Pam Young does not have the power to um, even <laughs> review uh, those types of, of records uh, due to the contractual, uh, due to the contract with the police. So we also need an independent complaint process. And what the CSSG, CSSJC has, has uh, suggested uh, is the creation of a victim compensation fund that would go towards helping to make the police accountable and restore public trust. So you know, one of the things that I saw in the report where it says the department has de-escalation instructors on staff, three of who were instructors at the, the Massachusetts Police Academy, uh, et cetera. These are things that the CSWG and um, my group pointed out only go as far as the will of the police force and the community because training does not assure that these missteps or abuses won't occur, won't occur, okay? But again, a review board, an independent review board that have would have some subpoena power, they could determine perhaps appropriate disciplinary actions. One of the things that is clearly um, uh, something that Pam Young's report and Chief Livingstone both point out is that one of the two officers spoke erroneously and that there was some type of harm as a result. We've also confirmed that with the youth. We have quotes from the youth. We have a letter from the families as a group what is not clear is what will happen next to make these families and these children whole. So while the principle for being made whole sounds real simple, we know it's a process. And if we want them to be made whole, we need to ask first for forgiveness and work to resolve this hurt, right? And to make amends. 
And what that amends amounts to should come from the injured party. And they've asked for a victim compensation fund to take care of psychological needs, any needs that they would have to make repair. So I just want to, in my statement, with some of the quotes uh, from our youth, and these are their voices. I listened to the police when they said we couldn't talk, had no rights, could not use our phones, could not call our guardians and or our parents. And so I just didn't move, didn't speak and complied to not make anything worse. I've been taught that if I speak respectfully with police, it's okay to ask questions. Well, I thought I could, but I did not dare to, and I was confused on why I could not call my home, and I did not dare speak up to ask anything. That really doesn't appear um, in, the, in the report. Will I always be punished because I have a tint to my skin, and now even more with me speaking up? Will we need to, to now be fearful of retaliation from the police? These kids are scared. I am not looking for any trouble. I just want to live peacefully. I worry if I'm okay to go anywhere, especially alone. I worry for my friends. I worry about how much the experiences with the Amherst police has taken my concentration on school and my studies because my safety and being of color was something I thought I would not have to worry about in this area. D. Lastly, D I'm finishing. The police were yelling, power tripping. They were yelling, we were detained. They were yelling, we had no rights. So I just want us to understand these are the voices of our youth. These are all our children. And we need to seek some way to have repair and reciprocity for them. Thank you. I need to ask people to confine the remarks to two to three minutes maximum. Deborah? All right. So I co-sign everything that, that Dee stated. Um, but for me, it's really like lots of holes in both reports and lots of questions. So hopefully Chief Livingstone and, and also uh, Pamela, you all can take the, the notes down because I really need these questions answered. Um, thank you, though, for putting the reports together, but, you know, lots of holes. So basically, the report for Chief Livingstone, your report does not address uh, anything in terms of why those young people were detained, and that was in the, the video, that they were detained when one of the officers stated that. It did not, did not um, respond to why they weren't able to, when they asked the question about the guardians, why they, they didn't get a, a, an appropriate response, like when, you, when they said that they wanted to talk to the guardians, and it didn't really go into any specifics. It's really a general report, doesn't really speak to any of the specifics that occurred that night. Um, what were the questions asked? You kept on saying that there was a, there was protocol and they were asked appropriate questions. What is the protocol, right? When there's a noise complaint, I want to know what the protocol is because if that's the protocol, that protocol is no good. So I need to know that. Um, why did you? Um, why when 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 those police, right? If they were veteran police officers, I don't even know if they were veteran police, but if they're police officers and they were both coming on two separate cruisers, they get there, they see that it's minors. Why and they saw that there was a flat tire. I'm assuming they have the training, right? As police officers, why is it that they weren't there to aid and help as opposed to, you know, uh, you know, the raw route that they took that we saw in that little less than a minute video, which was about making sure that they were detained, telling them they had no rights, and telling them they couldn't talk to their parents, right? So no type of, of help. Why is that? And why is it that uh, uh, officers don't, don't when they see a situation, why aren't they there to help, right? And so for me as a Black woman, when I, when I see a police per person because of these incidents, I don't think that they're there to help me, right? Because of these situations that happen. Um, let me see what else. Uh, so you, you stated in your report that you regret, that there was regret. What does that mean? I, I, I need to see an apology, right, from those officers, not regret. Regret is like, okay, I regret that I didn't, you know, you know, do my laundry yesterday. You know what I'm saying? I mean, that's not okay for a situation where, where, where young people were violated, right? I didn't see that in either of the reports, that there was a violation. There wasn't that, that conversation, right? So regret, no apology, no accountability taken, 
on the behalf of the police department around this situation, which could have been a five minute situation if they had arrived to actually help as opposed to telling these, these young people they had no right and intimidating them and traumatizing them. Um, let me see what else. Da, 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 da. So the, the, this altercation, like I said, was, was, you know, so stating that there was no arrest, that, you know, there was no citation and no physical contact as if, as if that's the end of it. The fact that, that they showed up, two armed police, right, saying what they said and intimidating those young people, that's the violation. It doesn't matter that they didn't put their hands on them, it didn't matter that they didn't arrest them, but the fact that that happened, so again, making those statements as if that's enough, like that's okay. You know what I'm saying? Again, no accountability. Um, so I, I do, I, I understand, obviously, I, I, based on my jobs, I understand that sometimes there's confidentiality around, you know, what transpired with the police, but, but we need to know, the community needs to know whether these police are, are going to be held accountable. You, you know, what does that mean, an inquiry? What does that mean? Uh, you need to, to give more than that, okay? Um, you said that the police and then, uh, you know, uh, meet uh, the, the, the post requirements. I need to know specifics. I, I want to, you know, you, you should show up at a CSSJC meeting, you know, maybe our next meeting and really break it down. Right. And really let us know how it is that the police department is meeting all of these post requirements. Um, then you said that you all have de-escalation folks. I mean, is this again, no, no, no specifics. Was this like, you guys had them and 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 their de-escalation tactics were not used then because obviously what happened on July 5th shows that de-escalation is not part of the police department's everyday thing. Or is this something that you all just did after the fact, right? And now you all are gonna be putting into place. And so what does that mean? I need I need specifics. Again, no specifics in your in your um, report. Um and, and I'm sorry, I'm taking time, but you know there was no none of these answers. Nothing was was answered in this report. It's a very it's a two page report with, with no answers. Um, and then with Pamela's report, it was more so kind of like, yeah, time for recon reconciliation. How are we going to reconcile do reconciliation if there's been no accountability, no apology, no um, uh, path in terms of moving forward, no healing, no anything. You know, and first you have to take that, you know, to tell the community to trust and to start building uh, anything, you have to really put something there to say that we, we can reconcile. Because if not, you're just putting the onus on, on the community. Um, and then there was, and sorry, there was one other thing on, on the chief's report, which was that, you know, around the, the Spanish speaker and saying to the, to the parent that the police felt that they were communicating well with them, how, how do you know that? You know what I'm saying? No, this was actually in Pamela's report. It, how do you know that? You know, just by stating that, yeah, you know, the police felt that they were they, they were understanding, that doesn't say anything. That's not communicating anything. So I need Deborah, to know more information. I need to ask you to stop. Okay, what, one, one last one, one last one. Um, you know, just please look at the protocol, right? So if the protocol is that, that was stating in, in the diversity, you know, in this diversity report, what is the protocol and the protocol needs to change? Thank you. Chief, is there anything you'd like to comment to at this time? I'm not look, sure if Ms. Fiera was looking for answers right now to all of those questions. Okay. Um, I can certainly try and answer them all now or if she would like something further in writing or as she mentioned to attend a, a future meeting with the CSSJC group. I mean, if you have responses to some of them, that would be nice. Would Chief it... Livingstone, did you want to respond to any of the questions at this time? I'm sure there's some of them I can answer, certainly. Would it be possible for us all to speak and then you could speak, Chief? Sure. Because I'm sure there are other questions that the, the CSSJC has and um, I'm sure the town council. Would that be possible? Sure. Yeah, I'll Thank try you. and keep track of as many yeah. of these questions as I can. Appreciate it. Pat Anabaku, please, two to three minutes. We have one hour and we're already into that time. Good evening, all. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Young. 
um, for the report and your comments tonight. I'll try to be brief, even though I had a lot to, to talk about. In addition to what Ms. Shabazz and Ms. Ferreira had said, I agree with them. Um, this is to the Chief Livingston. Seriously, I felt after reading your report that you did not have compassion to the youth. There was no accountability. There was no apology. And I wonder why should tax dollars pay for your salary in this town? I think you need to think about stepping down because you are not representing or I, I'm or sorry, I need to interrupt this line of questioning. It is inappropriate for Why anybody is it inappropriate? to sit here and ask for a police chief's resignation in this meeting. What I'm saying is for him to consider it because as a black woman in this town and for the report, this is not report. This is like putting pacifier into a, a crying baby to keep quiet. Okay. I do not see how this town will move forward towards healing. When there is no apology, no nothing except for defense. To me tonight, this is just a show. Theater, waste of people's time tonight. Nothing will come out of this. Two, and two to three minutes is not enough. I have more to, to talk about, but this is not okay. The kids are hurting. They need to be made whole. And we're sitting here, ask for, for, for a report for more than three months. And this is what we this is what we got. Mediocre report. Really? Would a black chief police do this in another uh, 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 predominantly white town? Hell no. That would never happen. Frankie. Um, thank you very much. Um, this is an incident that occurred and it's a learning experience. And I think um, one of the things that we could do in learning is um, have a better sense of what exactly happened so it doesn't repeat itself. Um, in that vein, I have a few questions um, for both um, the police chief and for um, Pamela Young. For um, Chief Livingston, the first question I have is how many family members um, were involved? Um, since part of the report says that um, two responded, one affirming and one not affirming um, the reports um, from the police. So how many family members? And then um, what would two fit in with the total number? Um, there's also information about additional videos. Um, my question would be, how many videos were there? How long were they? And why was the request to look at those videos denied? We already have access to one that's about a minute long. So what about the others? And was there any reason given for um, that request being denied? Um, in the report, it's also said that the second officer corrected the statement of the first officer. Um, if you could expand on what that means um, for us. And this is just a side comment, not really a question. I noticed that in the report, um, the word through was spelled as T-H-R-U, which is short form, I think. It would just make sense to have it as something spelled through. But again, I'm not sure what the style is um, for those kind of reports, but that's something to consider. Um, for uh, Ms. Young, one of the questions I had was that in the disputed facts, there was something said about the officer voice and intention. If you give me a moment, I'll read that. 
says the officers voiced an intention to discriminate against college students as the officers offered this as an excuse for their behavior. This is among the disputed facts. Um, if there's a way to flesh out what that means. Um, also in your report, it is said that the attitude of the officers arriving at the scene, their continued presence after the arrival of two parents and the position of the officers' cars while awaiting the tow truck escalated the situation. Um, what did that escalation mean in the context of um, what happened? And then another question is the statement that was made or the report of August 14 says at least three of the nine individuals were BIPOC. But this statement says that we have six BIPOC. And so I'm wondering, do we consider the different numbers a discrepancy or is the information that came afterwards, how would we know um, the relevance of that information coming um, afterwards? Um, I have an additional question, but to keep it within time, I think I'll rest now. Thank you again. So um, with your permission, I can answer those three questions now. Uh, at the time of the first report, the information that I had about the racial identity of the use was that it was at least three of nine. I wasn't sure of the exact number, so that's why that was phrased. Um, following that initial report, uh, there was additional information that suggested that it's, it was six of nine. So that's why there is um, the difference between the two reports. The other questions that you have are uh, comments reference to the, su the summary section of the uh, parents' letter. So I um, did not have the permission uh, when I spoke with the parent to include the parent's letter in its entirety. And so I, through communication with the parent, had provided a summary of the key points and the parent uh, expressed back to me that my summary was a good synopsis of the key points of the parent's letter. So that is what appears in that first column of disputed facts. So it is the parent who is alleging that, um, that the officers made a comment which seemed to, uh, to indicate that they were trying to justify their by behavior by saying they regularly have interactions with college students. And it was the parent um, who said that the um, arrival of the officers and their behavior uh, de-escalated the situation. Um, so that's what's in that first first uh, um, in that first uh, um, column. Pillow. Mm -hmm. Did that answer your questions, or did? Great. Yes, it did. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Hello, Pam. everybody. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Phil Bavila. I'm a CSS at JC uh, committee member, as well as a co-chair of the Human Rights Commission. And so the line of questioning um, that my colleagues have done so covers most of what I want to get into, but more, um, and I will second all of what they have said. And more so what I would like to get into is kind of the process for this report to come out or the investigation of this Chief Livingstone, uh, being that we, as a Human Rights Commission, were the ones to put out the formal request. It very much seemed as so that we were not given the due respect of at least being aware of an investigation happening, an investigation continuing to happen, the close up of it and so on. So I just like to understand kind of that process and maybe look at it to see if we need to change that process as well as the DEI department. I understand that we didn't have one fully until July. And so I would like to maybe make a request, make an advice, I don't know what you want to call it, but 
that the DEI department does have some type of seat at the table. And I don't know if that needs to be done through the collective bargaining agreement or anything as such, but I really do hope that we are taking that into consideration, being that looking at that report, we can see that there was some wording of discrimination happening. And so maybe having an outside lens outside of the police department will give purview into structural racism and others that occur. Last, I'd like to go on the comments of um, my colleague Deborah that it very much does feel as if the police department is not really owning this issue, right? Like the, pol the police officers were the one that said it. And whether or not an apology at this point, three months later is going to correct things or not, it's a step in the right direction just to own it. Just own it, it happened. You know what, our community can grow from this. Our community can move forward from this. And I think that that is what we're really calling upon and looking for is to have the police department and the police officers, the police chief, everybody involved to own it. And then we can start to discuss how we are going to move forward and what is going to happen because it really does, and in Deborah's words, put the onus on the children and the family. It makes it feel as if that if the police department is not going to own this issue, then the families kind of have to be like, okay, now I guess everything has happened for three months. This report came out, the DEI report came out, and now I guess we should maybe go seat at the table. Maybe we should go and go reconciliate with the town why can't it be that the police department say hey we messed up and we messed up badly we are sorry you messed up how can we move forward and i'll leave that as my last comment allegra um i just wanted to thank all the members of the cssjc for raising such important points i certainly agree with everything that's been said so far tonight um and in reading both reports um i was like other members have mentioned left a little disappointed and still a little confused about what exactly has happened um and so i just in in the police report i'm wondering what exactly it means saying that um, one family affirmed the police actions and one family disaffirmed the police actions and what actions are we even referring to when we're talking about the actions of the police. Um, and I think just to bring it, I guess perhaps this is more of a, a knowledge question for me. Um, I was really struck and negatively so by the statement in the DEI report saying the officer did not perceive a language barrier. I again agree that I don't think it's up for the officer to determine whether or not that person understood what was going on, especially in the context of interacting with a person who has authority in a town and, and somebody that you might have fear around. Um, so I guess my question would be what are the protocols in the police department when there is interaction with a person who's not English speaking? Are there officers that speak other languages in the department? How many, how often, how are they deployed? Is that, you know, are they able to send a Spanish speaking officer if they know that there's a Spanish speaking person or, or whatever other language capacity the department might have, if any? Because um, again, I think the CSSJC is really grappling with accessibility for all community members, understanding that not all community members are English speaking. Um, so that is, again, translation services or bilingual capacity or things that we are thinking about and looking at. And I think it would be helpful to understand what the department's capacity is in that sense. Okay. Are there any other comments from people that have not spoken? That includes counselors. Michelle? 
I do have some comments, but I was wondering if Chief Livingstone was going to answer some of the questions before we sort of circle back to counselor comments. Are you uh, talking about comments with regard to the reports? Um, well, to the whole situation, really. No, then I th I, I'm looking for anything with regard to the reports. That's where we're focused for the moment. Okay. Okay. Dorothy. I understand that this is a very complicated situation. And I guess I was glad to see the word regret in the police report. And I guess I'm aware that for in masculine culture, which the police department is, even if there are female officers, even the word regret can be a hard word to say. But I, and I really do want to say, I do appreciate our police department and I count on our police department to keep us safe. I really do. But I have been troubled by this incident and I would, I would truthfully, I would love to have it over. In my heart, I believe that the police department really knows that that was not their best day and that they want good relationships with the young people in this town, but maybe aren't quite sure how to get there. And I'm not saying I have any magic wands, but um, I, I guess I'm counting on Chief Livingstone to um, think of a way to bring this to a close. And I did like the words of Pamela Long Young about reconciliation and grace, but as some of the committee members said, that takes two sides to be active. And at the moment, I think we need a little bit more. We need to be moving towards each other. We need to get together again. So we need to have healing as the committee says. That's it. Chief Livingstone, did you have anything you'd like to say at this time? I mean, I can answer the questions um, and I'll try and go in reverse order unless there are other statements or questions that anybody else has. Please go ahead. All right. Uh, Miss, let's see. So Miss Allegra, um, you asked a question about what it means that one family affirmed the police actions and one disaffirmed. So when the uh, officer that was investigating the incident reached out to all of the parents and all of the families to meet with him, only two responded. One was happy with the police response and one was not happy with the police response. So the family that was happy with the police response is the one that was affirming it and the one that was unhappy with it disaffirmed that. So that's what that means. Um, as far as officers that speak different languages and fluency in our agency, we have officers that speak Chinese, Portuguese, many that speak Spanish, Polish, and of course English. Uh, but as far as foreign languages, uh, uh, Chinese, Portuguese, Spanish speaking, and Polish speaking officers. If there's an incident where um, you know we don't have an officer working and we need that language, Sometimes we reach out to the university police department to see if they have somebody that can speak the language or Amherst College Police. They do the same thing with us, vice versa. Um, if it's something that's not urgent where we need to have somebody that can come right to the police station, through our victim witness associations and district attorney's office, we have a number of people that can come to the police station. Let, let's say somebody needed interpretation in a language we didn't cover and it was a domestic violence incident, something like that, then we do have resources that we can reach out to to um, accommodate those folks. Uh, I believe those were the only two questions that you had. Mr. Phil, um, you had a question about how complaint files go on and what is the process for a complaint. So in the town, you can file, anybody can file a complaint. In this case, I think the complaint, the complaint was filed through the Human Resources, or excuse me, the Human Rights Commission uh, after the fact. But any, any individual can file a complaint through your office. They can come to the police station and file one if they wish. Um, they can go to the town manager's office uh, and do that as well. In addition, any, any civilian, any citizen 
can file a complaint with the post commission as well. And the post commission will look into that incident as well. Uh, excuse me one second. Hey, can you guys bring those guys upstairs? Apologize for that, my dogs are bark. Um, let's see, the next question I had written down, I think was from Miss. Excuse me, I could, could, clarification, could you explain what the post commission is, Chief? So the post commission is a, is a new, it's a new commission that was voted in in 2021 um, through the state and it was yeah, the result of all the incidents and all the investigations that came out of the George Floyd murder. And it was a law that was passed by the state legislator that puts the, um, put all, puts all of the training requirements and all the requirements for an officer, a police officer to be certified in the hands of the state now. So, and everybody has, a, every police officer in the Commonwealth now has all the exact same training and all the same exact responsibilities. So the first round of officers have been certified and they're going through it in a, um, a slow and methodical process. So officers with last names that begin with A through H have all been certified in, in the town of Amherst. And that means that every Amherst police officer has met the requirements of the post commission for training, for graduation, um, you know, anything that covers anything to do with with policing across the Commonwealth. You know, they checked all the backgrounds of every police officer, make sure there were no past incidents of misconduct. Um, I think, you know, if you've been following the news, I think across the Commonwealth, somewhere of 90 officers have been decertified. In other words, they, they can no longer be police officers. Um, so the, again, they're taking a slow process on that but they're looking at every aspect of every police officer in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to either certify those officers and make sure they're legitimate and for the job. And if they're not, then they get decertified and decertification happens. They can no longer be in a police officer in the Commonwealth of Mass. Um, that's what the post commission does. And that's in a nutshell, what their responsibility is. There is a separate post commission that oversees that. Um, and if you, it's easier to go on their website. You can see who, who's in charge of that. Um, and, and it explains it in a little bit more detail than I was able to tonight. Um, another question, um, how many family members responded to the uh, internal inquiry? Two, two family groups resp responded to our request and um, uh, to, to the investigating officer. And I think I mentioned one affirmed and one disaffirmed the actions of the police officers. Um, how many, uh, the question uh, was how many videos are there? You know, I don't know. We were given access to the same thing the public was given access to. Uh, we asked for additional um, videos that we um, were told were out there. They were not turned over to us to view. We were allowed to see one other video, but only three seconds of it and it, there was nothing in that video. Um, so we had to our access for the investigation what everybody else has seen. So there's no additional video that we, we've been able to view or access at this time. Um, trying to find um, Miss Deborah's questions. Oh, so one of her first questions was, why were the individuals detained and not allowed to leave? Uh, why weren't the officers there to help? Um, when we first got the call for that, it came in as a noise complaint. Um, and the officers that responded, you know, we aren't told who's the complainant. We aren't told who is the person making the noise. All we're saying, all they were told is there's a loud, rowdy group in the parking lot at the 693 Main Street address. And so when the officers came upon the scene, um, the protocol is to gather the individuals, attempt to identify them. That's part of what the bylaw says for the noise bylaw. Um, part of our responsibility for responding to noise complaints is identify, identify the individuals. And then the officers have discretion on what they can do with that. They can either just give a verbal warning. Sometimes there may not even be a complaint, but if there's a valid complaint and there's noise happening, 
they can give the individuals just a verbal warning, which is what happened here, or they can give a town bylaw violation citation, and that's the purpose of identifying them. And in rare instances, they can make arrest, and that's all in the town um, noise noise bylaw violations um, for protocols on what steps police officers can take when they respond to noise complaints. Um, so uh, the officers did recognize and after conversation with the individuals with, with the youth there, once they got everybody together um, and were able to identify everybody that they identified them as, you know, um, as youth, as minors, that nobody had uh, a valid license at that time. So um, we couldn't allow them to leave at that point because they are all minors. And at that hour of the morning, which is now one or a little after one in the morning, um, they're our responsibility. So, you know, I think somebody asked, why weren't they allowed to call their, their parent or guardian? They are all allowed to call their parent or guardian after the officers got the information uh, about who they were. And, and the, so I think in the video, it may say some, it may show an obviously you can't, you can't call your, your parents. And what he meant is you can't call them right the second. Let's find out who we are and what's going on. And then we'll make a determination about what's going on as far as who we can get it for parents. Uh, let's say no parents showed up that, you know, we would have had to bring the, the, the youth back to the police station in order for parents to come in and pick them up. But we we're fortunate that a couple of parents came down to the scene and, and were able to take everybody home that night. Um, again, being minors, nobody being of the legal driving age, they were our responsibility at that time. Um, if we allowed them to just leave on their own and, and something happened to one of those individuals, you know, we would have been liable and responsible. Um, noise complaint protocol. So yeah, we have policies on that. Um, Ms. Deb, um, and I'm pretty sure that the, all the way back to CSWG has all of our policies um, that we, we had sent previously. So the protocols and the policies on responding to noise complaints should be in there, but I can get copies of that for anybody who wants. Um, I heard a couple of people ask, you know, why was there no official apology? Um, you know, part of my intention was when I had reached out to all the parents, um, you know, I wanted to have a meeting with all of them face to face with the officers and have a meeting um, with them on either on their terms or wherever they wanted to meet or at the police station. And, you know, I think I made the comment of we could get together and have pizza. And I think a parent took that as I was being either sarcastic, sarcastic or not, you know, heartfelt, but that wasn't the case at all. I was trying to give options to all the families to come in and have a discussion about exactly what happened and why the officers handle the situation uh, uh, the way they did and what protocols they have to follow in that process. Um, one of the other complaints or one of the other questions was well, after the officer, the, the first officer, the male officer on the scene uh, told the, the young, young youth there that he didn't have any rights. Um, again, he regretted that immediately. He, he told me he didn't know why he said that. The words came out and he recognized it immediately. The second officer on the scene, the female officer recognized it immediately. And if you watch the very end of that 53 second video, you will see her start to explain that's not what he meant. And then the video that we saw, and I think the public saw was cut off, but she goes through a 15 minute discussion with them about here's what's going on guys. And here's what's happening. Here's what has to happen next. She explained the entire thing to them uh, she's upset about it too. And, you know, so, you know, it's not, these officers don't, they're not feeling like this is an empowerment or a power issue. They felt horrible and still do to this day um, about, about this call, about this incident and the way it was played out and that there are students now, youths who are afraid of the officers and that's not what they're about. Um, you know, they're both very young officers themselves. They're in their mid twenties. Um, they're not veteran officers. They're relatively new to the force. So, um, you know, this is not some power trip they were on. So, um, and I think the last thing was, you know, Miss Pat, you want me to resign? Yeah, that's not going to happen. So, um, 
that's about all I have. I might have missed some of the questions. Um, but again, if you have additional questions, you can ask them now if we still have time. Uh, I think everybody has my email address. And if anybody ever wants to come speak to me in person, I have an open door policy. I'm always available. Um, I'm more than happy to speak with people. There's a couple different hands up. Um, I'm going to, I'd like to go to some people that haven't spoken. Uh, and I'm going to start with Michelle Miller. So I'm just, I'm looking at the time here and I see that there are other um, community safety and social justice committee members that would like to be, would like to speak, but I am, um, wanting to offer, offer a possible pathway forward um, with the primary objective of reconciliation. Um, and I do truly believe that we can get through this as a community and that we'll be better for it. What I'm hearing in this discussion is that there's a consensus that the officer spoke erroneously and that there was harm to the youth as a result. There's a need to restore the youth and their families and to reconcile the matter and the social fabric of our town. This is a key tenet of transitional and restorative justice. Just like with many matters that come before the council, this matter needs to be unpacked further. Our process as a council is to refer matters to one or more committees to look more deeply at the matter, including consulting with town staff and committees and obtaining a legal opinion. 8.2A of our town council rules of prestige states that the council may refer any measure to a council committee, the town manager or town multiple member bodies, which shall constitute a request for a report back on such matters. So with that, I would like to make a motion um, I have sent this motion to Athena, um, and with your permission, Lynn, I would like to offer the motion. Please go ahead. I move to refer the matter of the incident occurring on July 5th involving two police officers and nine youths to the CSSJC, HRC, and the AHRA to collaboratively review the incident with the input of the DEI department and other appropriate staff and in consultation with the town attorney for the purposes of making a recommendation to the town council to repair the harm and reconcile the incident by November 21st, 2022. A motion has been made. I have to look to the council to see if there is a second. I second that motion, um, Walker. Thank you, Alicia. Uh, you spoke to the motion beforehand, and so I'm going to go on to other counselors. Anika. I'm sorry, I couldn't unmute myself. Um, I do agree that this should be uh, moved to be able to be discussed where it is more appropriate, especially where there is legal review. Um, what I'm hearing through these conversations is, is each time there is something either added in and that's not complete with the reports. And what Pamela gave in her report was what she was asked to do and seemingly what she had the permission to share. Um, the other questions coming in terms of what is, is someone's perspective, I understand that that's confusing um, but perspective is, again, not law. And it also seems like for there to really be a solution to if you have two officers that go and deal with a group of youth and they're two and they're both English speakers, unless they have some sort of translating services, how is it ever out of perspective? You know, so I know that this is also what is being worked on, but this is, is just what we have. And 
you know, I, I'm sitting here and obviously there's a lot of pain and hurt that's going on uh, from these, from the youth, from their families, the one that have, you know, stepped forward and been able to speak. Uh, but, you know, there is also a lot of confusion here. And I have, you know, I have to, um, to get, get my thoughts right. On one hand, you know, we have, as I said before, we have Miss Pat who was holding this, the youth um, who has been declared their representative, but is not in capacity to do so, at least in a way that is dealing with municipality. This is your slowest course of recourse if you, what you want is urgency. It's not in our purview to do half of what is being asked. You know, we're, we're comparing this, as I stated before, we're comparing this to uh, the Little Rock Nine. If we were at all on that level, we, the town council, the town manager, Chief Livingstone, all of us would have been asked to kindly hit the road, pack the road and hit the road jack, just like Biden had recently asked and encouraged of the LA city council. So I'm hoping that we can, after this, do whatever it takes to get the right people connected, utilizing Pamela, bringing all of her resources where she would never have had to really step foot in Amherst to deal with this, because unfortunately, this is not a problem unique to Amherst or anyone else, anywhere else rather. But I'm hoping that we can actually get all combined, all connected who need to be, so we can actually deal with what happened with what happened, with which we can actually uh, show and prove happened, deal with that, and then put other procedures in place, as Michelle has just suggested, so we have a path of moving forward. Because these things will happen again, and they do happen, and we need plans in place. Because us sitting here speaking what we believe is right and wrong is not within this case, and what's being asked for going to move us forward or result in compensation. Thank you. Mandy Joe, you had your hand up. I've taken it down for now. Okay, Alicia. Um, thank you, Lynn. Uh, so I just wanted to say I am going to, I, I support Michelle's motion because I also agree that this situation deserves more attention and a committee and people who can specifically focus on that. And I think from what I've heard, collectively, that is the reason why we have not been able to address it because we don't have the time and we have so much going on. And so I think it makes sense to refer it to a committee who can look at it and deal with it more urgently. Um, but I also just wanted to say that like after listening to everyone's comments and reading the information in our packet, I feel like the priority for the committee that has come to us is like very simple. And what they're looking for is for town leaders and officials to come to the defense of and give support to the youth who were traumatized in the same way that Lynn came to the defense of the police chief tonight, very simply. Um, and it's that response, like it didn't take any thinking, like you knew it was wrong, you, you responded right away. It doesn't take three months to consider and to look into and to figure out what happened for situations that are urgent to get a sort of response. That is that we will support you and we are defending you because you are our youth and you are valued and you are valued community members and we care about your well-being and your growth and your support. It doesn't have to be that political. It really doesn't. I think we have politicized it like so, so, so much and that's why we're at the point that we're at. But if it was addressed urgently in the beginning, it didn't even need to be like this. Um, and then just thinking about our youth and thinking about our position as a town and being a college town and how much we value education and we value our youth and their growth and their education. And we take things like this very seriously. We think about their futures and we all know that trauma has a negative impact on development and significant effect on life circumstances, especially if it is stemming from the poor judgment of individuals who are, depart who are town leaders and officials who are sworn to protect them. Like that is a whole another layer of being traumatized. And then while these reports I understand are a part of the process, I feel like the bigger point is being missed and like lost in all of this like legal reports and, and we're missing information and we're missing perspectives. Um, but like we're missing the conversation about how to move forward as a town in reaching our goals because we do have that as a goal of the town to address white supremacy, to foster a more equitable town. Um, we need to 
really like in order to do that, in order to provide restorative justice, you need to look at those who are directly affected. Those are the only people who can point you in the right direction of restorative justice, because those are the people who were traumatized. We can't make things up on our own and say, this is how we can help them. And they have come to us and told us directly what we can do to help them. So that's also not something that we have to figure out. They have told us what restorative justice looks like to them. And now it is our part to decide if we are going to engage in aiding and helping them reach that restorative justice point in this situation. And I think the most frustrating part for me is that we have had a lot of things in front of us for over a year that could have helped us in aiding this process. Like we've talked about things that could be preventative me measures for our community to help strengthen our community. We talked about the Youth Empowerment Center. We've talked about helping to change the culture in our town and having the Multicultural Center where we can help bring community members together. And we've talked about the police looking at their protocols and trying to figure out what changes can be made with the intentions of being more equitable. We know we are not perfect. We know we are all humans. We know people will make mistakes. And that's why we also suggested a resident oversight board so that when things like this do happen, there is already a process in place and we don't have to spend all this time trying to figure out what to do. It would just already be in place. And this entire process is very much lacking victim support, which should be the central focus of this entire process. And so I am saying all of this not to point fingers at anyone, not even to point out the inadequacies that we have, but to say, like, look at all of this room that we have to grow and look at all of the harm that is continuing to be done when we do not act with urgency. We have a number of things in front of us that are in our purview that we can do to address the situation. We have set up a matrix about things that we have been looking into for over a year where we can address the injustices in our town. So like, it is not that we cannot do anything about this. There are things we can do. I, and so I think we need to get onto that. And so I think Michelle has the right state of mind because the council has made it very clear that we cannot make this a priority for some reason at this time. And so we need to send it to a group that can because this is an urgent matter. And the longer we wait to address it, the more harm that is done and the harder it will be to come to a resolution when it wouldn't have been this hard if we would have just addressed it right away. Alicia. Yes, I am finished. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you. Mandy Joe. Under section 2.10C of the Amherst Home Rule Charter, I am invoking my counselor right to postpone on the first occasion that a question is on adoption of a non-emergency measure is put to the council. Unfortunately, that means that in invoking this, it will be put to tomorrow's special council meeting. And let me just make sure, uh, Athena, a right to postpone is, do I need a second? No. Do I bring it to a vote? No, the right to the right to postpone using that charter section is an automatic to the next regular to the next regular or special council meeting. Okay, so the um, councilor has um, exercised the right to postpone. That means that this conversation will continue at uh, sometime three o'clock or after on tomorrow afternoon on the 18th. And that is not debatable. Okay. Um, I want to thank all of you. So does that mean we have to end all comments now? Yes, it does. That's the, that's uh, the charter. So Lynn, for us that are, that don't know, can you explain what just happened? Because yeah, I, I don't uh, know what, what, what. our charter has in it the provision for a any one counselor to uh, exercise the right to postpone a conversation. If they do that, it's automatic, and it is taken up at the next council meeting 
because we called the council meeting uh, for tomorrow, along with the finance committee meeting, uh, and that will only happen, by the way, if there are seven counselors present, that would be the next council meeting. To the best of my knowledge, there are no other council meetings between now and November 7th, right? Athena, where it's a committee of the whole. Uh, so if, and at tomorrow's meeting, if four counselors vote to postpone, then it goes to November 7th. And that is in the charter. So um, I so when with all due respect, and I, I appreciate Deb, you you asking for a clarification. <laughs> um, you know, this doesn't mean this is going away. And um, so we have to figure out a way to resolve this. Right. So we know that. And Michelle's, uh, you know, motion seemed like a reasonable way to approach it. I want to be very clear. The motion not only postpones it, but it stops discussion. And that is our charter. And I totally understand what you're saying, D. But I okay. cannot, I cannot undo a motion are the right to postpone that another counselor has said. So Lynn, just clarification again. So do we go on the same link tomorrow at three? Uh, just so you can give us yes. more information. Yes. Okay, same link tomorrow at three o'clock. Tune in tomorrow at three. Yes. And it might be postponed again from what you're and saying. If four counselors vote tomorrow with the right to postpone, I believe the number is four, then the next time it would happen, uh, the right to postpone would be on November 7th. And that is the, Athena, I want clarification from you and you have your hand up. I, I wanted to clarify that the link for tomorrow is a separate link from tonight. That yes. There's, there's a different link posted for the finance committee meeting I'm, tomorrow. I'm sorry, D, the link for tomorrow is not the same link as tonight. The link for tomorrow is under the finance committee meeting and it is. Um, can that can that be shared with uh, CSS JC? Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. And it brings it'll bring you into the audience, and then the chair of the finance committee, and I will work out how he wants to proceed with that. Okay. So, Miss Lynn, this is what white supremacy looks like. That's exactly. What this is what it looks like. You have an issue that impacted BIPOC community, a white counselor singularly postponed there. What an insult to the, to the BIPOC community in this town. Pat, I accept your comment. Um, I think the best thing at this point is to take a break. And um, I just wanted to say as the chair of CSSJC that we actually in our meeting agenda that's posted for the public have a public comment period. So I'm hoping that we can open our meeting to public comment before. If your public gets... comment would have been the public comment of the council. What? They're not the well, public. We didn't, we didn't know that. They're not the public. We're not doing any other public comment this evening. You were posted to be a meeting jointly with us. We did not post another public comment tonight. Yeah, so this, I have to agree with Ms. Pat, and I think history um, shows what this council is doing, unfortunately, through the charter and how we are being treated and how our young people are being mistreated. So we will follow your rules and I think we'll see that this is not going to bear good fruit for our community, and it won't be because of us, because we are trying to make whole and bring people together. But it has to be transparent, it has to be honest, and we have to be committed to the truth. If I'm I, and I confirm I'm with Ms. Pat, too. I'm sorry. I confirm we... with Ms. Pat. I'm if, on with Ms. Pat. If I may, very quickly. Yes, I made a comment about the chief uh, considering stepping down. It should not shock people. If it shocks some of you, 
surprise because this is what folks are already discussing in our town. Some segment of our population who are not happy about how okay. police is treating our people in this town. So it shouldn't I, come as a, as a shock. And Ms. Lynn, one more thing I want to say. A woman in the audience in the last joint meeting came and insulted by uh, black women. You didn't say anything. And then when I tried to speak tonight, you, you, you tried to shut me down, to silence me. I think you need to be consistent with your rules. Thank you. Okay, we are going to take a break at this point. We will reconvene at nine o'clock. We need to adjourn this. So do, did we adjourn our meeting though? I'm sorry, <laughs> CSSJC needs to adjourn their meeting. <laughs> We're done? Oh, okay. What a waste of time. <clears throat> and if CSSJC refuses to adjourn their meeting? We're going to have to exit you to the audience. That's I'm called being shut emotion. down, babes. You're being shut down. Yeah. Yep. Majority BIPOC town elected uh, town committee is being treated with so much disrespect tonight. Yep. Exactly. Excuse me, is there a motion to adjourn? Adjourn for what? We're not done with this meeting, for what? Other, other items should, should be postponed. Like the, I, the item is postponed and, the, and you need to all adjourn your meeting so we can go on with our meeting. Mm -hmm. I regret uh, that is the way it is. Uh, Could I request that uh, the co-chairs of the CSSJC give us direction on what to do? Um, because in the absence of that, given the environment right now, I'll simply leave. Thank you. I am not going to motion to adjourn if another member of the group would like to. That is um, that is up to you, um, but I am not going to make the motion. We will reconvene in ten minutes, and at that point, we'll move on to the next agenda item. I don't have any choice. If I do anything else. It is breaking the charter, and that's a violation. So, is there an open meeting law violation for not having public comment that's posted on CSSJC's agenda? You shouldn't have posted public comment on CSSJC's agenda. It should have been only that you were meeting with us jointly. So is there an open meeting law violation? Because it's posted on our agenda. No, because this is a council meeting and you're part of the council meeting. Your meeting was posted so that you could meet jointly with us for this discussion topic. I'm, I didn't review your agenda. I shouldn't have had public comment on it. Well, we're staying on. Yeah, I am. Okay. We'll reconvene at nine o'clock and move on to 7A, I mean 7B.
Allegra is our quorum four. I believe so, yes. Since we're being recorded and we still have a few seconds and we have not adjourned, I'd like to just make the public aware in the audience that Mandy Johanneke is a council member at large, which means that any town resident can vote her out next year if that is a possibility. Thank you for that, Philip. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I need to say it again. I'm sorry. You need to say it again. Can you repeat yourself? As you return, please turn your video back on. Thank you. As you return, please turn your video back on so I know that you're here. Michelle Miller, are you back? 
Dorothy Pam, are you back? I am, but I, I've lost the ability to moder turn on my mic. No, we I'll can hear your mic. I think it's your picture that you may have Right, lost. what I have is leave webinar. If I click that, I'll disappear. But I've, I've lost my open and close picture and open and close mic. So I will say leave webinar. So, because I, I don't know what to do. Okay, thank you. Alicia Walker, can you hear us? Yes, thank you, Lynn. Um, Michelle Miller, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you. Shalini Baumil, looking at your video, but there you are. Thank you. And Dorothy, you have straightened things out. Okay. Yes. yes. All right. I'm going to adjust the agenda in the following way. Uh, we're going to take up seven. I'm sorry, I lost my notes. Um, item 7B, we're postponing till November 7th. Item 7D, uh, the town manager's self-evaluation is in your packet. Um, the, uh, that brings us to appointments. There are none. Uh, the committee liaison reports, uh, we can quickly go through those. Um, CRC, Mandy Johanneke. Um, oh, I'm sorry. We have one action we item. We have an action item. We do. We do. Thank you very much. We have an action item. Uh, we're going to go to action item 8A3. And I'm going to read the motion, look for a second, and then we will discuss uh, with uh, the counselor that asked that it be removed uh, the reasons to remove it. Okay. Okay. The motion is as follows to adopt appropriation and transfer order FY 23 05 C an order appropriating funds for a portion of the town of Amherst Capital Program, School Track and Field Rehabilitation, recommended by Finance Committee on October 17th, 2022, and shown on page nine of the draft motion sheet. Is there a second? Second, Devlin Gothier. Okay. Dorothy, you uh, asked that this be pulled. Just because it's important to speak up and say things, even if you know it won't make any difference. I will say that we should not use artificial turf because although people who like to win and people like to have the first and the best and whatever want it, it is not only very expensive, but it is dangerous to the students. It can cause MRSA. It has been proved that, it can, that things can be spread. It can cause concussions. It is very hot and it's also filled with chemical, chemicals and PFAS. Tony Cunningham sent a very good um, letter to the town today with many links leading to research. And I don't think that this research is unknown to you. I just think that people get carried away with our Amherstian desire to always be, get the biggest and the best. But in this case, it's not the best. It's harmful to the students who will play on it. Thank you. Okay. I'm looking for other counselor comments on this particular item. Michelle Miller, you have your hand up. I wanted to um, also share support for that concern. Um, I really appreciated getting Tony's message and I've a bit out of the loop in terms of uh, what research has been done regarding that and what our particular appropriation, uh, how it impacts you know, that piece of the project or not, because I understand there's a natural and a synthetic. So, I also wanted to raise the concern that I am, I have, and, and that the Board of Health, I believe, is is also, I I think, looking at these um, toxic materials um, and and things as well. So, just curious if anybody has additional information about it. Okay, thank you, Alicia. A comment on this particular item. 
Um, not right now, sorry, thank you. Okay, Pat DeAngelis, comment on this item? Yes, I'm um, calling on section 2.10 bylaws and other measures to postpone this discussion until the next council meeting. Okay. Um, that means I, that I feel I, I'm very angry. I think it was a mistake. Um, I think that we needed time to really think about Michelle's motion. And because of the needing of time, I was probably going to vote no. But I feel like we truncated something. And I, and, and I think it's really important. So I may, I don't know. But right now, I want to postpone this till the next council meeting, because I don't think the damned artificial turf is as important as what we were talking about. Okay. Your motion was to postpone, and now you've made a motion to postpone till the next meeting of the council. Both of those, in fact, are tomorrow at the Finance Committee meeting. Okay? All right? Yep. Uh, that's not debatable, and so we will not deal with that until tomorrow. Um, we are now we have finished with the action items. We're going on to um, councillor reports. CRC, Mandy Jo. Um, nothing new to report. As announced earlier, we have a community listening session on. October 24th at 7 p.m., one week from tonight, on the rental bylaw work that we've been doing. The packet is up, the link is up, everything is in that packet. Okay. Elementary School Building Committee, Paul and Alicia. Actually, Sean is also here. Is there anything, Paul or Alicia, that let's start with Alicia? Um, thank you, Lynn, for calling on me. I actually appreciate that. However, um, I have been an, unable to attend the past two meetings and just as a plug because um, the time conflict with my new job and the committee's unwillingness to change the time frame to support someone who has a job during normal business hours. Uh, so I don't have an update. Kathy would be a better person to reach out or maybe Paul or Sean to figure out what the most recent um, changes have been. And Alicia, am I correct that the next meeting is scheduled so that you are able to attend? Um, I am hoping that that may be the case. I haven't yet gotten the new schedule of the times that we are meeting, but I think they were looking to see if we can alternate meeting times so that I can attend every other meeting. Um, I'm just not sure if that has been finalized yet. I've seen a schedule, Alicia, I'll make sure I forward it to you. And yes, Thank they you. are alternating that, okay? Thank you. Absolutely. Paul? No, I was just going to say the same thing that the uh, chair did start to, re to schedule the meeting. So one would be in the morning, what, what, one was going to be in the afternoon, because we're going to lose people either way, and felt that this is a way to keep both all the people involved. Um, no, new, no new updates on the uh, school building committee. It continues to work through the design committee. There's a design subcommittee that's meeting every other week on the off weeks when the, the school building committee is, is not meeting. The one thing that I do know, however, is that they did approve the uh, design, or not design, I want to get the right name for this. They re approved the change in the schedule for when it is submitted to MSBA. And that is a um, decision of the elementary school building committee. And that will be part of our discussion on November 7th. Right, Paul? Okay. Um, Finance Committee, Andy? I have nothing to add to the written report and the brief report that I made about the intended agenda schedule for tomorrow when we had the announcement. Thank you. GOL, Michelle? I will not be offering a report I stand in support of Councillor DeAngelis' comments, and I would like Athena to offer, if possible, the um, reference to the motion to adjourn the meeting, because uh, I'm not willing to participate, and I'd like to adjourn the meeting. 
Could Athena please provide that reference? You can certainly, you can just make a motion to adjourn. Thank and you. It requires a second and then we can have a debate or we can move to a vote. Yeah, I think um, I, I am moving to adjourn this meeting. Second, DeAngelis. Is there any other comment or question at this time? Alicia, you have your hand up. Um, yes, just very quickly. They, um, I really appreciate um, Councillor DeAngelis right now, and I want to speak that forward because that was a terribly uncomfortable situation for me. And I honestly, like being on the council is like something that I am very proud of because I worked very hard to be here and I feel ashamed right now, like very deeply ashamed and embarrassed to be representing a council that would do that to community members when we fought so hard to get them this one hour um, that they deserved. And so I am in support of adjourning the meeting and I appreciate DeAngelis's confidence in moving that forward because I was feeling conflicted. Dorothy. I have to agree. And I would say also that Alicia was extremely eloquent and when you shut things down, when somebody has just been stating the issues so well, for another time, you, you change the momentum. And I will say as a feminist, that's what men have been doing to women for so long. And I felt it all through my being. Yeah. I just can't stand being shut down like that. So I think we should be ashamed. I agree. And Andy? I just wanted to point out that under um, rules of Procedure 7.1, which is where motions to adjourn our motions to adjourn are not debatable. Okay. Then we are going to move to an immediate vote. Anna Devlin Gothier. No. Lynn Griesmer is a no. Mandy Johanneke. No. Anika Lopes. Yes. Michelle Miller. Yes. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yeah. Kathy Shane is absent. Andy Steinberg. No. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. Shalini Balmil. No. Was that a no, Shalini? Thank you. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Seven in favor. Five no's, one absent. The motion carries. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you, Jesus. There are three members of the public with their hands up. I just want to note that, um, although we have not adjourned our meeting yet. Um, so I, I'm wondering if they have the opportunity to speak. I'm not in charge of the meeting anymore. I've adjourned a council meeting. Um, so I see four hands up. I don't have any authority to actually let them speak. I don't think because I'm not a host of this meeting, but I can. The council meeting was adjourned. Mm -hmm. and but the CSSJC meeting was not. The members of the public would like to comment. And our meeting had public comment on our agenda as it was posted. We're trying to clarify, Allegra. Thank you. It's pouring out. We're trying to get the meeting adjourned. We're trying so to clarify. Thank you, Lynn.
May I speak? Athena. Um, I, I can um, bring public commenters through if the CSSJC would like to take public comment okay. before they adjourn. Yes, please. The, the CSSJC is still in session. If there are members of the council who would like, they are not part of this meeting. And in fact, we need to make sure there's not a quorum of us in this room. One, two, three, four, five. If I may, the council meetings adjourn. So councilors who would wish to stay, I'll move to the attendees. They would move, be moved over to attendees. Okay. Uh, would you please move me over to attendee? So Athena is going to stay and facilitate public comment for CSSJC and any other discussion until you choose to adjourn. Does that help clarify? Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I see three mm -hmm. members of the public with their hands up. Um, the first is Eva with a sunburst. I am so proud of you. This is what democracy looks like. The representing the people, representing the truth, standing your ground. That was absolutely unacceptable to be shut down that way in the middle of moving toward a solution for the well being of our young people in this community. I am so proud of you and proud of the counselors that, st that spoke up and shared human feelings about the disregard and disrespect that was shown to this committee and to this community and to our young people. That's representation. This isn't politics because my name looks good on the screen because my name is all over town because I'm a counselor. You are representing the people and the truth and the human experience of the disregard of the powers that be. I am so incredibly proud of every single one of you that stood your ground. It's not easy doing this online and how we're gonna do it and how we're gonna sit, but you did it. Keep going, we've got you. Let's go. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Um, I see Vera Cage has her hand up. I... Hi. Can you Hi. hear me? Yes. Hi, Vera Cage, uh, 12 Long Meadow Drive, apartment 21, Amherst, Mass. I a lot to process this evening. I am not surprised by the comments of the police chief. He is not my police chief and the chair of the town council is not representing me either. This clarifies to the town and to everybody that may have that may not have been convinced that this town is not ready and prepared to come to genuinely engage with communities of color, with underrepresented people in this town. It was, it is a statement to know that barely any family members would be willing to speak to the police. There needs to be an intervention. I'm very disappointed also in the town manager. He is not my town manager. So please intervene, somebody intervene, because this is such a strong statement that this town is not willing to give up its false notion of white supremacy. It is not ready to move forward with true reconciliation because it cannot acknowledge that there are victims who were harmed in an incident that occurred in our community. Because to recognize that there are victims is to be held accountable for your violations. Thank you. Thank you, Vera. Um, I see Paige has their hand up. Hi, thank you. 
Thank you all. I just repeat everything that the first two speakers said. Um, where's the sit-in? Where's the revolution? Let me know. I'll let people know. That was atrocious. It was the most atrocious thing I've seen in my 23 years in Amherst. Thank you for standing up. Thank you, Paige. Um, I see Madeline Gelnet, perhaps. Please apologize. My apologies. Oh, no worries. It's a weird name, last name to pronounce. Um, I just want to say this is like legit my first public meeting that I have ever attended. I thought there was going to be a lot more like public comments, but that did not happen at all. Um, I just want to say that I am so sorry what happened to you in that meeting with just getting shut down like that. You guys should have had your voices. I don't know. It just it just seems so strange to me. I, I'm a new student here and I just kind of, I don't know. I was supposed to attend this meeting to a school pro for a school project. I had no idea that the town of Amherst was like this at all. Um, so I just want to say I'm so sorry for what happened. And um, I really hope at some point this town finds some sort of peace with each other. That's nice. my comment. Thank you, Madeline. Um, my, oh, there it is. Um, I see Brianna Owen. Hi everyone. Wow, that is all I have to say for tonight. I wanna to thank each of you for all of your, brave, your bravery and advocacy. Um, one thing that really stood out to me is history continuing to repeat itself. I hope that in the future, the DEI director and CSSJC may have the capacity to look into the inequities embedded in the charter because these rules, regulations and policies is what keeps white supremacy alive and silences equity and inclusion. Thank you, Brianna. Um, I see Zoo. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, hi. I just wanna simply, well, it's not simple and it's not simply, but thank you all from the bottom of my heart for standing up and not standing down. I'm a parent of one of the quote unquote Amherst Nine and it's all extremely hard to continue to hear about, but however, it's really important that the subject and it's not, you know, lost. And so every thought and every feeling as I am, you know, watching and listening to these uh, meetings, um, and my next question and thought and feeling that comes up, you guys are right on top of it and ask and, and say, so I just really appreciate you all. And um, it's, it's hard. I hope, it, I, I hope things change because that's my main concern for my child. Thank you. Thank you for speaking out. Um, Thank you. I see Edgardo. Hello there. Um, yeah, I'm here just to say that I have uh, witnessed uh, what happened in this meeting today. I'm extremely proud of those of you who uh, stood up uh, for truth and for uh, trying to um, move things forward in a uh, positive way. I, I thought for a minute there, I saw a little rain, a little, little bit of sunshine at the end of the tunnel and like we were getting somewhere um, and then it just got completely shut down and wow I just want to just really proud of you those of you that just really kept your composure throughout that that stayed in the meeting and that actually um, facilitated um, uh, the opportunity for those of us who were witnessing this to be able to speak up and um, and stay there and stay put and hold your ground. Um, uh, much appreciation and, uh, you know, um, palante. We, we will continue and I'm not from Amherst, but uh, Amherst is my community as well. And I love those of you who make Amherst um, a, great, a great place uh, to be, to live and to work at. 
and anything I can do to help support, uh, I'm there. Thank you so much, Deborah, for being there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I see Jay Buentello. Hello. Hello. Um, I just kind of, I just wanted to further agree with what everyone's been commenting and say thank you so much for your hard work and for speaking up and it it was really painful at points to be a part of that meeting just listening and I'm just I'm grateful to you guys for being there and speaking up and yeah a lot of hard work ahead <laughs> um, so thank you thank you um, I see Anita Sorrow. Hello. Um, as a white woman who has lived in this town for many years, uh, I have never been shaken to my core the way I was by this meeting tonight. Um, how sad that a student would have an introduction like what was displayed today. I, I really, I'm still shaken by it. And I am looking and grasping for ways to address this. <clears throat> and I'm going to be looking um, to all of you good people who have the good sense to see and name what the issues are to help me find a way into this to be able to make it better. Um, I look for action. I'm desperate for action. Um, th this has, has, I have never seen a display like this. And if there was ever a reason to, to burn the charter down, it's what we saw tonight. So I am grateful to you for being here and for hanging in, for providing the leadership that has long been missing in this town. And I'll continue to be looking in this direction, not to the elected leadership of this town, but I will be looking in this direction to guide us on a proper path because we're going down a very destructive road if we look to our elected officials right now. So thank you. Thank you for providing uh, the leadership and guidance and uh, know that there are those of us who are desperate to help. Thank you, Anita. Thank you. Uh, I see Amilcar. Yes, thank you. I want to take up uh, with you all, just as an individual, not as in the embodiment of the AHRA, but as an individual member of that body. Um, our chair, we met today, and our uh, co-chair, Michelle Miller, was the one that was in the process of introducing the motion. And as I understand the motion, it was to refer further consideration of this matter to CSSJC, to AHRA, and to the Human Rights Commission as three independent committees with similar interests uh, that may wish to discuss this matter and uh, develop a proposal to return to the council. I want to let you know that I have considered this matter, just again, me personally, we haven't deliberated it as a public body. We didn't deliberate this today as a public body, but I am personally aware and I do um, uh, wish to talk with you all individually, officially, in a bilateral way like this. I hope that the Reparations Assembly can talk you know, all the way back to when our efforts were rising for reparative justice and when it was CSWG going on. You know, we have had certain parallel um, 
uh, goals, let me say. And from time to time, I have felt there's a need for us to maybe talk about where our parallel goals may coincide uh, and how we may mutually support each other's work because you know the cultural centers and the other measures that were talked about tonight as perhaps could have helped to prevent uh, the, the devastating effect this incident is having on our on our community and on our on our town culture. That if we had those, well, part of what we're looking for is input for how specifically for black reparations measures like this maybe are areas our plan can em should endorse, should embrace, and should call for the, the necessary funding and the necessary civic action, town council action. It's enough to deplore the elected officials. It's a different thing to hold them accountable for what they're, what uh, for the C, uh, uh, WSG uh, uh, community uh, working group uh, recommendations, CSSJC, your you all's continued work. It's imperative that you know we talk and see how we can support those proposals for where they dovetail and coincide with the reparative justice plan that we are developing and have a listening session coming up at the Hitchcock Center. Thank you for your patience and listening to all of this. And thank you for your ongoing work. Thank you. Um, I do see two hands up. They are from people who have already spoken. So I don't know if you um, have something else to say or would like to lower your hands. I see Zoo still has a hand up. Um, sorry, something, I didn't have a hand raised, my bad. Okay, no, I just wanted to make sure you didn't have anything else to say. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, I believe that everybody in the audience who, had a hand up has spoken. Um, if anyone else would like to say, uh, see Jennifer Taub has her hand up. Hi, um, I, I just, I, I'm speechless as you, I just wanted to, you know, um, extend my apologies. I know that doesn't mean much for what happened this evening. Um, I, I feel terrible and I feel especially terrible because the CSSJC came to the meeting to have this conversation. And now I just hope that you can join us in the finance committee at three o'clock tomorrow. I mean, you're all very busy. And so I feel as, you know, um, especially terrible that you, you know, that it happened, but that you may not be able to join the conversation. You had put all this time and I hope that you can be there tomorrow. Um, you know, if if the meeting continues, and um, you know, I know there are well, there there are many of us on the council who want to work um, very closely with the CSSJC, with Aura, and um, you know, to to come to be able to work through the situation. You know, as um, you know, we all express that we want to do and that uh, what happened tonight is devastating and is not helping us to move forward and um, you know address the situation in the in the way address everything that's happened in our community forward in the way that that we wanted to so I just um, I, I didn't want to sit in the audience and, and not say anything but um, and I would also concur that we probably need to look at our charter and uh, that that's and, and revisit that. Um, and maybe we, I don't know, we could, that's something we could work on together as well. So thank you. And thank you for, um, you know, 
all that you're doing to uh, make our community a much better place. We, we took a few steps backwards tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, Dorothy, Pam. I just wanna to say to Ms. Pat, your answer was quick and accurate. That is what white supremacy looks like. You write the rules, the rules are difficult and arcane and only some people know them and you use them. It's like shutting off the mic on somebody. It's like putting a gag in their mouth. I mean, I, I, I just, I think you're great. And Allegra, I think you kept your composure. Um, I could tell you were feeling very strongly because you got very, very pink, okay? <laughs> you kept your composure and you realized you didn't have to go. You're right, you had a meeting and all of you stuck together and you supported it. So I think that was great. I think that was really something, um, but it was a horrible moment. And I'm sitting here thinking, oh my God, that's that young person's first experience of local government. But it's a true experience, folks. It's a true experience. Those in power are in control. So we have to figure out a way to get more power. That's really what it is. And I just think you're doing a great job and I applaud you. So thank you. Thank you, Dorothy. Um, I see Pam Rooney also has her hand up. Hi, everybody. Um, it was going through my head that we, we seem to have structures. I, I was reflecting on this as we were listening to the police protocols and the, the rules. And we have the, we have the charter rules, we have the police procedures, we have the police protocols. And ostensibly those are all for making, you know, law making equitable and even handed and giving everyone the same opportunities so that everyone is you know, treated in the same manner. And, but it is, is very clear tonight that, that those who know the rules can call them. And um, many of us have paced under some of those, <laughs> some of those types of control mechanisms. Um, and you've got the absolute brunt of it tonight. Um, I think we were, I think we were ready to take that motion to refer this, this, this situation that really, really wants to get resolved, healed, and, and understood, understood. So, so we don't approach groups of kids waiting for flat tires, you know, in that, in a in a callous way, it, it it needs to the town needs a humanity to it that isn't allowed under protocol structures and strictures, and so um, I look forward to working with you more on this. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Alicia. Um, hi, everyone. I just also wanted to take the time to really appreciate the work that you all are doing as a committee and to stress how significant and important it is and how much our town really needs it. Um, and I feel really terribly that town officials and other town leaders don't always give you guys the recognition and support that you deserve. Um, and I also am feeling very badly that I did not immediately stick up for you all. Um, and so just wanted to say that I also share in the feeling singled out and intimidated by other town officials. And sometimes it's really hard. And so I also like appreciated that there were other counselors that supported you all tonight. And it made it a lot easier for me to support you all, which I really strive to do every time that it comes to a conversation around the CSSJC because I really believe in the work that you're doing and I really believe in all of you as a committee. Um, you all are great individuals and great assets to our town and like the hard work is what is going to make the most profound impact and so I know it's hard and taxing 
Um, and so I just really want to give you like the most gratitude for continuing to do the work and for sitting through the really hard things and for not giving up. So thank you all. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you. Uh, there's Cambridge Families of Color Coalition. Hi, my name is Amara Donovan. I uh, was born and raised in Amherst and now do anti-racist work in Cambridge. Um, I also just wanted to affirm the work that you all are doing. It's impactful. It has made monumental changes for Amherst and for surrounding towns already with the work that you all have done. Um, Alicia and I often talk about the harm that it is to be a BIPOC person in the town of Amherst representing um, the many BIPOC people who live in Amherst. Um, and so I just wanted to acknowledge the harm that was caused to you all tonight. Um, and to say to folks who are supporting in the audience and supporting from town council and their positions that um, it's one thing to say thank you for all your hard work. It's another thing to support people when they've been harmed um, and to be steady in your continued support. Um, so I hope that people uh, know also who are new to the Amherst community that um, this is normal. This is a lot of what the CSWG has experienced and the harm and the barriers and the blockages and the lack of information and the resource hoarding that exists in this town. Um, and this group and many others in the town have been dedicated and have been sacrificing themselves um, for this work for a very long time. And so um, I was proud to see what happened tonight. Um, and I was also very sad to see the harm that occurred. So I hope that you all get to take care of yourselves and that the community also cares for you. Thank you, Amara. Um, Vera. Hi, Vera Cage. I, um, I'm hoping that the counselors and the chair of the council could review the, the charter. Um, you know, it says that, um, let me pull it up. The right to po postpone allows one counselor to require that a vote on a non-emergency measure be postponed until the next scheduled council meeting. So the key word here is non-emergency measure. So that is uh, a source of, uh, a contest contention, right? Some of us feel that this is an urgent matter that has been stated. Clearly this particular council who evoked this uh, right to postpone did not see this as urgent. And so there is a divide in this community. And where do we all land in that division? So I would hope that the chair um, look at the charter and see areas where the chair could suspend the rules if there is an opportunity to say that there is a vote already being acted upon and would this have occurred, would this be allowed, you know, during the, when the vote was, was being taken um, or if it was just another motion on the agenda um, that was not um, put forward or in motion. So th those are clarification questions and interpretation. I, and I hope that the chair um, could look into that and, and respond accordingly at some point after further research because the chair does hold power, I believe, um, to do many things. And that is to exercise discretion. And when that word of non-emergency, that should have been debated. Thank you. Yeah. I see no new hands up. Um, I see a few council people and a few audience members who have spoken who have their hands raised still. And I don't wanna silence anybody who still has things to say. Deborah, you have also had your hand up for a while. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, I just want to say that obviously um, today's actions was just, you know, despicable. Um, but my, ha my hat does go off to those counselors that stood up, um, you know, starting with Pat DeAngelis, you know, so much respect for her um, and others, uh, Michelle and others who just stood up and, you know, um, and Alicia, you know, and obviously all of those um, and adjourned the meeting. But this is obviously a tactic that they used to, to shut us down. And unfortunately, even for me, like tomorrow, I can't, right? I work, so I can't join tomorrow. So I'm hoping that whatever counselors show up tomorrow, that the same thing happens, that they adjourn it, okay? That it gets shut down again tomorrow because it's not gonna be fair for them to, to, to bring it up tomorrow because that's what they're trying to do to derail this, this thing. And this thing is not gonna go away. And if they think that they're going to, to, continue, to, to derail this, they're only going to make this get more and more of an issue. And in terms of the healing, that healing is not going to happen. Instead of them just owning up, you know, for the police chief, all we were asking was for the police chief and others to own up to what happened and to remedy the situation and to treat our young people in our community as human beings with compassion and empathy. And that did not happen. And instead what happened was derail to try to derail and to try to divide even more. So I'm hopeful, this is the message to the counselors that tomorrow that gets shut down so that then we are able to be at the next conversation. But most likely there's gonna be more that's gonna happen in between then in terms of you know possibly put the word out, pro protests, whatever the case may be, to show that this is real. And as Vera said, this is an emergency. This is not something that, and they've been dragging their feet since July, since this happened. These are our young people, or are they not? That's the question I want to pose to the town. I, you've just sent the message clear that these young people are not part of the town, that their parents and the families who are hurting are not part of the town. But guess what? They're part of my town, and I'm going to continue to fight for them. Ms. Pat. So I really want to thank the counselors who really were courageous to support us tonight. By supporting us tonight, you also, you supported the MS tonight youth and their families. Thank you, you know who you are. I don't want to miss anybody's name. I appreciate standing up and doing the right thing tonight. So for our CSJC meeting, for me, I think we need to think very deeply how we continue to work with the town council. We can't just like attend their meeting tomorrow. I will propose that we come up with our own grand rules. We cannot take this anymore. They can't just treat us like nothing. When they bring up their own rules, we need to come up with our own as well, as long as we're not breaking the law. And that's what I tell parents who have kids with special needs. I said that the school administration will always come up with their rules. Just ignore them sometimes, as long as you're not breaking the rules. And that's what we did tonight. Thank you for Allegra and Dee for your leadership with our committee, for us you know, standing our ground tonight. And in terms of moving forward, I don't see the path at this point because the town has not, the, uh, the, the police has not owned up what has happened. No accountability. Until that happens, an apology, and we make the MS9 and their families whole, there will be no community healing in this town. It's not going to happen. Enough is enough in this town. They've taken us for granted for a long, long time. The MS Police Department is not working out for all the residents in this town, period. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pat. Philip? Yeah, I'd like to second the thanks, many thanks to the town councilors that were in support of us and were able to adjourn town council meeting and I do second and echo that I hope that it is continued tomorrow and so on and so on until 
this issue finally gets the attention that it deserves and needs. And I'd like to say that possibly between the three committees that were suggested in the motion, we all have our own meetings and we can all invite slash make agendas of our own time. So as far as the Human Rights Commission, I would be in support of any type of meeting conjuncture that we have. We do have one coming up on Wednesday, but if we need to make a meeting at a later date, uh, whatever it is, but we can figure that out. And we do have um, town employees in support of that as well to help us in the legality of what we just saw tonight. I'd also like to say that, again, I'd like to echo that the town councilor that made the motion to adjourn is definitely practicing white supremacy. She knew exactly what she was doing and she knew how to do it. And again, she is a counselor at large and everybody that is still listening in, please, 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 next November is a vote.